These are not my hands. I rely on the augmentation given to me by the metal gauntlets, so much so that the flesh beneath them is now little more than a distant memory. A day will come when I will strip it from me. Least I lose the power to master myself forever. The flesh is weak, but deeds endure. Rest. We were not made to rest. We go on, unflinching, unstoppable, unending in our strength. The Emperor did not make us for such mortal concerns as hearth and home, vanity, or contemplation. We are his engines of war, his hammers beating out the fabric of existence into a vessel fit for mankind to inhabit. The Iron Hands are not saviors, nor should we be. A man who cannot save himself is weak, and the weak do not deserve to be saved. For such a man, only death is fitting. This we can provide. The flesh is weak, sickness Injury, mental anguish, all failings of our mortal coil. Oh, the pride and projected strength of humanity. How we seek to protect ourselves from the truth of the fragility of our existence. The event horizon that is our death. But where the flesh fails, withers and rots, iron can replace that pillar. Immutable, powerful. An augmentation for our weakness. A journey walked by the Tenth Sun, the Gorgon of Medusa, the Primarch Ferus Manus. Father to a legion whose very identity encompassed his own inner struggle on the path toward strength, and the ambition to grasp it all under the crushing embrace of an iron fist. To the fortieth millennium, the sons of the Gorgon entice fear within humanity. The image of the union between the blessings of the Emperor of mankind and the Omnissiah. But who are the Iron Hands? Who was Ferris Manus, the Gorgon of Medusa? Their story begins in the 30th millennium. Terror, the cradle of mankind. Scarred and damaged by the very actions our species had inflicted upon it for millennia. But despair and death was not its destiny. From the horrors of the Age of Strife, the millennia of darkness and rampant madness, we had survived. In the Himalayan mountains lay a fortress, a palace, within the foundations of an empire that would spread to the stars. A child, vulnerable and weak, lay inside a gestation capsule, growing, destined to become something more than human. A future under the tutelage and training of a man that would unite the lost colonies of mankind. But that future never came to pass. The gestation capsule was torn from the ground, Cast into the sentient realm of madness, the warp. Claws scraped upon the glass and ceramite, as creatures of nightmare desperately tried to get in. The capsule with its treasure inside, tossed and turned within the warp, finally spit back into real space, in Segmentum Obscurus, hurtling towards a planet in the Thule sector. The capsule began to heat up the edges searing as it collided with the atmosphere, and with a thunderous clap it crashed onto the surface of this strange world. Amongst smoke and fire, a child emerged, 
his survival proof that he was more than a mortal man. Air filled his lungs. He took his first steps feeling the dust and smooth dark stone underneath his feet. It was upon Karashi, the ice pinnacle, the largest mountain upon this world, where he had landed, but yet no light met his eyes as the gloom of a dark chamber surrounded him. He was inside the mountain, locked deep inside a chamber which his capsule had punched into. No panic crossed his mind, only confusion and the desire for information. Upon the remains of his gestation capsule, he discovered a mark, an X, a symbol, a name, his name. He did not know. The child began to venture out, exploring further, seeing through the minimal light with eyes that were beyond human. Shapes and structures that were too precise, too clean to be natural. He saw runes. All around him was carved, orderly dark stone and electroconductive stalagmites dotting the walls and ceiling. He did not know where he was. He did not know who he was. But he knew what he saw was wrong. It was alien. But he was drawn to it. Like a part of him yearned for the understanding beneath feeling it resonate within his core. But something was wrong. From the corner of his eye he saw it. A beast slither out from the chamber. It was enormous. A silver body with segmented plates and sharp talons that gleamed even in the darkness of the cave. A biomechanical frame that moved with the grace and venom of a beast. Thrashing violently as if it awakened from a deep slumber. The child immediately attacked it, each primitive lunge or strike, leaving not even a single mark upon the beast as it slithered out of the chamber. What had he done? What had he released? The thought racing through his mind. But worst of all, he couldn't stop it. I was weak. The thought ran cold in his mind. Following the path of the beast, the superhuman child crawled his way to the surface, dust and soot under his fingertips. For the first time he looked out towards the vista before him, a world of grey skies, mountains of black stone and withered life stared back. Medusa, a world that still showed the scars of relentless mining from humanity in prior millennia, gutted of nearly all of its precious metals and minerals. Life itself was muted, as if the colour and vigour had been purged from it. All of this was taken in by eyes the colour of dull silver, upon Karashi, the ice pinnacle. Shapes in the distance caught his gaze, silhouettes that looked like his own, but smaller. Others like him. Humans. No, he told himself. His path lay with the beast he had just unleashed. The creature that had bested him. The one that had shown him how weak he was. He was curious, but how could he present himself to others like this? Without even knowing the concept, the boy made an oath. A singular purpose. He would slay the silver beast. The Shadowlands. A place even darker and harsher than base Medusa is where the boy strode. Creatures and beasts of nightmare stalked this unforgiving place. And as the child began to grow, at an unnatural speed, he hunted them. He was simply one more monster in the mosh pit. One by one they fell. Monsters of tooth, scale and fang, under the tally of the child from the sky. Each battle, each near-death experience evolving him. From his own mind he forged tools and weapons, the knowledge and skill innate to him as if it was in his very blood. He bested a storm giant in a feat of strength, and he scaled once again Karashi, the ice pinnacle, with his bare hand. He swam deeper than the horned behemoth of the Sufirian Sea, all of it accumulating into a being of strength. 
a hunter, one with a singular purpose of testing himself, improving himself constantly. A man who cannot save himself is weak, and the weak do not deserve to be saved. All questions of who he was, why he was here in the strange world, was buried. It was that silver beast, the one that he had been too weak to destroy, that plagued him. The great silver worm, Asirinoth. After years of battle and improvement, the now young man finally set his sights upon the beast that had almost killed him. He stalked it for days, hunting it across the land until he finally caught it. The battle had begun. He threw himself at it, striking it with fists, but even then he couldn't make a dent. Upon land and sea, the two fought bitterly, all of the young man's equipment forged by his own hand, breaking. Even his own body was pushed to the limits, as a monster of flesh fought one of metal. In a valley flooded by volcanic magma, the young man lifted the enormous silver worm into the air above his head, and then plunged it into the flow. His arms were burning. The pain was excruciating, but still he held it as it thrashed. He held it below the magma until it melted. And when he removed his hands, they were coated in the living metal of the beast. It was flexible, like flesh, yet as hard as any metal he had ever seen. Like from all he had hunted before, he had taken the lessons of strength and bound it to him. But Asirnoth, his greatest enemy, his purpose for living was bound to him forever. Emerging from the Shadow Lands, the humans of this world saw an enormous figure clad in rudimentary armor. The humans of this world had seen sightings over the years, spreading the rumor of the hunter in the mountains. What stood before them was more than a man, a being with a face that was stern and brutal, as if it had been carved from stone itself. A man with iron hands. The techno-barbarian tribes of Medusa would find a new apex predator, a man who would bind them all to his will, a man they would call Ferris Manus. He was clad in tattered chainmail, strung with a harness of saw-edged Medusan steel. Blood streamed down from his trembling hands as he forced himself to rise. Before him stood a warrior in gold. He was the light, pulsating energy. He was sovereignty personified. His armor was masterful. The craftsmanship perfect. He was so far above him. They had fought for days, Ferris giving every ounce of strength he had, but it was nothing compared to the being before him. He was looking upon the most incredible and horrifying thing he had ever seen. His creator, his father, the emperor of mankind, Ferris Manus. It was the name given to him by the people of Medusa. He had no need for a name. Perhaps the X on his gestation pod was it. But the man with iron hands had become more fitting. The techno-barbarian tribes of Medusa, roaming around this barren black and grey planet in fortified land crawlers from a more enlightened age. If the shifting landscape Violent eruptions and swelling seas were not enough. The constant inter-clan strife made for a brutal existence. The people of Medusa were a harsh, stubborn, and ambitious people, their rugged features matching the hearts within. One by one they were challenged by the man with metal arms. Each battle a test, as Ferris had been tested before until all of the clans across Medusa were brought under his iron fist. Atraxi, Burkhar, Felg, Karduran, Lokopt, Morgul, Ongvar, Vorganan, Sorgal, Averni, Garsik, and Kargul. 
It was an overlord ship created from violence, but also mutual benefit. The Iron Fathers, the half-man, half-machine, spiritual leaders of the people of Medusa for millennia, bargained their own long-kept secrets and technology for the brilliance locked within Ferris. They had tried their best to kill him many times, but even they were brought into an agreement that mutually added to each other's strength. With the people of Medusa under his sway, Ferris also led the bravest of the warrior clans to delve into the frozen realms, breaking open long sealed vaults and salvaging the majesties of technology from humanity's golden past. But the era of Ferris's rule was not just of expansion and innovation. War never ceased upon Medusa. Battle had made Ferris strong. It had made the people of Medusa weed out the weak. And so conflict between the clans continued, all under the watchful dull silver eyes of the demigod silver-armed man. Seeing the life and death struggle as a whetstone to steel, each piece of technology discovered, the people of Medusa looked on in awe, as Ferris seemed to unravel its intricacies with just a look, like the blueprints were etched onto his mind. He did not know why, but Ferris felt the process of dissection and understanding always well up. It was innate, like recalling a memory you did not know you had forgotten. It was decades of battle, self-improvement, ruling, forging, and then innovation, all accumulating to the day a golden eagled stormbird descended from the sky. A being of golden light strode forth, too beautiful a form for a world like this. The Emperor of Mankind, his creator, his father, had come. Ferris had known all along he was different, someone like this world and its people, an outsider in his heart. And now the answers had come. He was utterly outmatched. It was like when he was a child, pounding on the metal of Azirnov's body. His best was nothing compared to this being. Broken and bloodied, Ferris submitted to his father, the Emperor of Mankind. It had been missing for years. A goal, a target, a singular purpose. A challenge, a new Asirnoth, to push himself forward, to build his strength. And there he stood, a being so perfect, because it was purged of all weaknesses. The ideal, the end of the path he walked. Submitting to the strength of the Emperor, Ferris found that his horizons would take another hit as his gaze was dragged from Medusa and turned towards the stars. The Imperium of Mankind, the empire born upon terror, that sought to bring truth and enlightenment to the lost colonies of mankind. Humanity had suffered the age of strife, an old night, but one singular being would not let us slip into decay and ruin. Once again, humanity would achieve a golden era and mastery over the universe, the Great Crusade. But for such a grand vision, it needed warriors, it needed generals, it needed Ferris. Perhaps in his heart, he'd always known he was created for war. The thrill of battle, of testing yourself against worthy foes, he was made for this. The Storm Walkers, the Adeptus Astartes, superhuman warriors created from the gene seed of Ferris himself. Sons to him, as he was a son to the Emperor. A legion of warriors that would be his. But before that, he had to be trained to fight amongst the stars. Under the direct tutelage of the Emperor, Ferris was gifted with arms, technology, knowledge, military doctrine, the best the Imperium had to offer. It was upon Terra, the world of his origin where he had returned, decades after he had been cast adrift. Now it was the bustling heart of a growing empire. 
Beneath Mount Narodinia, inside the greatest forge of the Urus, Ferris created and birthed new wonders and creations alongside the Forge Masters who had once served the Terawatt clan. All were astounded by the Primarch's innate understanding and brilliance of his technological mind and the miraculous shaping wrought by his metallic hands. But Ferris was not alone now in that category of the extraordinary. There were others like him, other Primarchs, his brothers. The first he had met, Horus, first found son of the Emperor. Again a tang hit him. The Emperor was so far above him that it seemed like an impossible mountain to climb to his level. But here stood a brother, an equal, a still unnerving feeling for one who had become the apex predator of his world. He was not sure he could ever quite accept it. But here in the forges of the Ural, he met another, a face of porcelain with long silver white hair, a slim physique that resembled a dancer's grace. His face was a thing of beauty, as if it had been cut from marble. The Primarch Fulgrim. It was as if he was his opposite in every way, the beauty and the beast. His brother had come to the forges, proclaiming he would craft the most perfect weapon ever made. A boast that Ferris could not let go unchallenged. Stripping to their waist, the two brothers began their first duel. For weeks, the two demigods toiled at the forges, the sight living mythology to those who gazed upon it. Banter and jibs were traded, as often as Hammer met Anvil, bells ringing to the toll of challenge. Each looked upon each other, each pushed more and more to outdo the other. For three months they toiled. The brothers told each other everything of their story, their ideals, their philosophy, their mutual pursuit of perfection, of expunging weakness. Finally, after endless toil, Ferris looked upon his work, a master crafted, keen edged blade, filled with a fire that his arms knew fondly. Fireblade. In the hands of Fulgrim, a hammer of perfect weight, proportion and form. The brothers smiled and laughed, truly, both in awe of each other's pieces, declaring the other's work was greater, a rare display of humility. And without a word, they gifted their perfect weapons to each other, a pact of brotherhood and friendship to last until the stars faded. He was his first friend, Fulgrim. All he had known was battle and the fires of the forge, but now Ferris knew brotherhood. He was not alone in this universe. It would be with Forgebreaker hefted upon his shoulder, with the promise to purge weakness and pursue perfection that Ferris would do battle amongst the stars. Across numerous battlefields, against horrifying Xenos and non-compliant colonies of mankind, the Primarch of Medusa battled under the direct tutelage of the Emperor until finally he was ready to become the general he was born to be. Returning to Medusa, the 10th Legion, the Storm Giants were remade. Swelling the ranks with the people of Medusa, Ferris remolded his legion. The clan system of Medusa was integrated into the tenth. Autonomous cells unified by one apex, Ferris. Again, the rivalries of Medusa were encouraged. Less open warfare, but competition, and each of them specialized in their own way, each on a different path to expunge the weakness within themselves and bring a unique strength to Ferris's armory. The Terranborn Astartes were adopted into the Medusan clans, a symbol of unity and submission to the creed of Ferris. The 10th Legion, clad in forged black armor set out to the stars, ready to join the Great Crusade. Ferris had conquered a world, and now he would conquer the galaxy 
at the head of a legion of his sons, his warriors, his iron hands. The flesh is weak. Eradication of the weak is all that will prevent humanity's backslide towards heresy and extinction. And like necrotized flesh, it must be expunged, amputated, replaced by the strength of iron. And do my brothers not suffer in similar adverse conditions? Or are they somehow able to overcome such deliberations? Ferris pressed. I do not know, my lord. The Primarch grunted and addressed Santar. Do you concur with your fellow captain? I am as frustrated as you, my Primarch. Ferris's eyes narrowed to silver slits before he turned his back to regard a broad stratagem table that had manifested in the wake of the hololith. I doubt that. He muttered. He passed a shimmering silver hand across the geographical representation of the desert continent to magnify the view projected across the glass slate. Several potential node locations were identified by flashing beacons as well as two further markings, a red and green dotted line. But it fails to answer why we are so far behind, said Ferris, glaring at the red line as if doing so would will it further across the map. Unsurprisingly, it did not. My lord, if I may. Desan began, and Santar groaned inwardly, for he knew the mistake his fellow captain had made, even before he'd made it. Perhaps there is more slow in our efforts than merely sun and sand. Speak plainly, brother captain. Sorcery, my lord. I can put it no plainer than that. Our efforts are thwarted by Eldar witches. Is that your best excuse for failure? His silvered fist clenched at the edge of the stratagem table, birthing a web of cracks that would have riven the landscape with the catastrophic earthquakes had they been real. Desan felt the imaginous tectonic ruptures all the way up his spine. It would explain why our efforts have thus far- Ferris Manus's fist slammed against the map, arresting the floundering captain's words. The resulting split almost broke it in two. I am not interested, he said, and it was as if the air in the stark chamber grew colder, cold enough to burn. The Primarch folded his arms, fathomless silver pooled across his immense biceps, shimmering and refugent. This son, who had seldom been this close to his lord for so long, found his sight drawn to them. Do you know how I came by this magnificent aberration? asked Ferris. Noting the captain's interest, Desan hid his confusion at the line of questioning well. Like most exceptional beings, Primarchs were occasionally inscrutable. Have you heard of my deeds? Of how I bested a storm giant in a feat of strength? Or how I skilled Karashi, the ice pinnacle, with my bare hands? Or perhaps you are familiar with the day when I swam deeper than the horn behemoth of the Super Huron Sea. Do you know these stories? Desan's reply was not much louder than a whisper. I have heard the great sagas, sire. Ferris wagged a finger, lost in monologue, and nodding sagely, as if he'd just come upon the answer to his own conundrum. No, it was a Cyrnoth. He was called Silver Wind and the greatest of the ancient drakes. No blade could pierce his metal skin. No spear or lance that I possessed. He paused, as if reminiscing. I burned it. Held its writhing body beneath the lava lows of Medusa until it was dead. And when I withdrew my hands, they were... He held out both his arms. Like this. I saw the saga speakers would say... Uh... My lord. Santar wanted to intervene, but a lesson was being imparted. The tale was simply that, a story crafted by bards and the tribal orators of the clans, as related in the canticles of travels. It was told differently every time the first captain had heard it. No iron hand could claim its veracity, for none had been present during the lightless days 
of the Primarch's arrival on Medusa. Only Ferris Manners himself knew the truth, and he kept that inside the locked cage of his memories. Do you believe such a warrior would allow himself to be undone by witchcraft? Do you believe he could be so weak? He asked. Dasan was shaking his head, trying to atone for a transgression he did not fully understand. No, sire. Get out. The words escaped Ferris's lips in a rasp. Before I throw you out. Dasan saluted and turned on his heel. Santar was about to join him when Ferris stopped him. Not you, First Captain. Santar stood his ground and straightened his back. Have I raised weak sons? Ferris asked when they were alone again. You know that is not the case. Then why are we confounded? The Primarch's collar cooled as he took to pacing his ruined stratagem. I've been away from the war front too long. My brother's draining my attention. You have become malleable, tractable. I perceive a weakness of purpose in our ranks, a failing of will that holds us back from our objective. Eldar's sorcery is not my concern. Finding and destroying the node is. We should have the mental fortitude to overcome tricks. I am leading this campaign and I will not be bested by my brothers. We are strength and example to all. The reputation of this legion, my reputation, will not be besmirched. No more delays. We press on at speed. Leave the army divisions behind if you must. Nothing must prevent us achieving victory. Santa frowned as he saw resolve turn to melancholy on Ferris's face. Desan serves you unshakably, as we all do. You have forged strong sons, my Primarch. Ferris relented. His hand was heavy and crushing as it fell upon the Ekri's shoulder. You make me temperate, Gabriel. I suspect you are the only one who can. Santal bowed his head respectfully. You honor me with your praise, my Primarch. It was well earned, my son. Ferris released him, leaving the shoulder numb beneath the guard. Dessen is a good soldier. I shall tell him you said so. No, I'll do it. Better come from me. As you wish, my Primarch. There was a long pause as Santar considered what he was about to say next. Ferris had his back to him again. Voice your concerns. My eyes might be cold, but they are not blind. Very well. Is it wise to abandon our auxiliaries? We might have need of their support. Ferris's head came around to regard his first captain swiftly. The Primarch's calm demeanor scorched to ash as something molten and unpredictable burned in his gaze. Are you questioning my orders, Aquari? Unlike his less experienced captain, Santar did not falter. No, Primarch, but you do not seem yourself. Anyone but Santar would have been struck for speaking so candidly. As it was, the first captain experienced a moment of disquiet as his Primarch considered his reaction. Santar's fists were clenched, the lightning claws poised for release as his warrior instincts took over. Ferris's fury ebbed as quickly as it had flared, and he stared into the darkness. There's something I need to tell you, Gabriel. Ferris met the first captain's gaze. It is for you and only you to know, but I must confess it and I warn you, speak this to no one. An implicit threat lurked at the periphery of the Primarch's trailing words and a nerve of tremor in Ferris's jaw flickered. The first captain waited patiently. I've had strange dreams of late. Ferris muttered. It was utterly unlike him to do so, and set Santa on edge more than any threat of violence ever could. Of a desert of black sand, and of eyes watching. Cold, reptilian eyes. Santa had no response. He had never seen his Primarch vulnerable before. Ever. Should I summon an apothecary, my lord? He eventually asked when he noticed Ferris rubbing his neck. Under the gorget, just visible above the lip, the skin was raw. An irritation, nothing more. It is this place, this desert, there is something out there. Now Santar felt a real concern and wanted to end the campaign in short order and venture to fresh theatres of war. The Legion can destroy the node unassisted. Flesh is weak, my Primarch, but we shall not be slaves to it. And like a shadow moving from across the sun, 
Ferris brightened and became his old self again. He clasped Santar's shoulder in a grip that was painful for the first captain. Muster the legionary captains. I will lead us to our enemies and show them how strong the sons of Medusa are. My course is set, to query. Nothing will stop me. Nothing. With Gabrielle Santal gone, Ferris returns to introspection. Nothing. Not even the promise of battle could shake his bleak mood. Like an anvil hung around his neck, it dragged him deeper towards an abyss. Fulgrim could lighten it. He was sure. But then, the Phoenician was not here. You are all my sons, and the fires of the forge burn as hot in your hearts as they do in mine. Chain them, master them, and you shall wield a deadly weapon. But allow them to rule you, and you shall be lost. The flesh is weak. A battle cry that had been screamed raw from the throats of the iron hands across thousands of worlds in the galaxy. To be warriors in the Great Crusade was a duty and path that required the iron hands to become the perfect warriors. And a perfect warrior was one who had expunged all weaknesses from him. Ferris knew this. Rather than join humanity on Medusa, he had turned to the Shadowlands, seeking to purge himself of weakness by battle and survival. He hated weakness. It had no place in the utopia he and the Emperor was building. The weak made mistakes. The weak failed and died. A creed passed on to his sons, who despised weakness with equal zeal, as they crafted themselves into stronger, wiser, and greater warriors. But on that very journey to purge oneself of weakness, there was a roadblock. A weakness they couldn't overcome. Their flesh. Flesh withered. Flesh was susceptible to disease and injury. Flesh tires and fails. The flesh is weak. The Legion looked to their Primarch and saw his arms, the shining metallic beacon of strength, a badge of honor as the corpse of Azirnoth coated his own flesh. Hands that could mold and forge without the heat of flame. So when their flesh failed them, they replaced it with something more reliable, something that wouldn't get sick or decay. Augmetics. Iron. And like necrotized flesh, it must be expunged, amputated, replaced by the strength of iron. Bionic hands became common amongst the Legion as the decades passed in the Great Crusade. A part of Ferris approved of his son's dedication to the eradication of weakness, but yet a part of him despised it. Were these augmetics their own strength, or the strength of a machine? Could it be truly called theirs? But what could he say? His own arms were not his. They were not his hands. He knew deep down that he wielded the strength of something else, but he would never dare voice this display of weakness to a legion that required him to be a symbol, an inspiration. Iron did not bend, so nor could he. Some had even questioned why the lines on the metal at his shoulders were so clean, almost like it had been dipped rather than plunging a thrashing beast but the truth would only be known to Ferris. Launching with a 52nd expedition, Ferris and the Iron Hands Legion continued to battle across the stars as more worlds and colonies of mankind were brought into the Imperial fold. The mortal humans of the Imperium would turn to see these enormous warriors clad in cold black armor. To see them fight was akin to watching living myth as demigods strode across the field of battle. Ferrers and his legion strength, a skill that they had sharpened like a whetstone to a blade, crushed the enemies of the Imperium. The decisive hammer strike. In an alliance closer than any other legion, the Iron Hands and Mechanicum of Mars filled with the greatest equipment and artillery the Imperium possessed. Battles that would have cost millions of lives were spared. 
as Pharaoh's and his iron hands projected the strength of more than tenfold their number. Their very strength spared lives. The Great Crusade had earned Ferris honor and victory, experienced to add to his self-craft of the perfect warrior, the perfect legion. But something gnawed upon him as the Great Crusade progressed. His brothers, his equals, his rivals. Learning of his father had humbled him, but learning of his brothers motivated him. At the dawning years of the Great Crusade, Ferris had been found before many of his brothers. There had been a time when there were few Primarchs, but after decades more and more of his brothers were rediscovered. Each of them raised upon different worlds and masters of their own different creeds. There were those he admired, Fulgrim, Gilliman and Vulcan. Fulgrim, a true friend and a brother to walk down the path of perfection with. The one who gave him the nickname he cherished so dearly, the Gorgon, the Gilliman, a master of a skill that had been alien to those of Medusa, diplomacy. But beneath that visage lay a ruthless mathematician and bureaucrat, the makings of not just a conqueror, but a ruler too. Vulcan, like him raised upon a world of fire and smoke, both masters of the forge and craftsmanship, but unlike Ferris, his brother's core was molten, kind-hearted, where his was iron. Again that feeling came to him, the one he dared not admit to himself, that he was no longer special, no longer the strongest in the room. A feeling that at times motivated him, and at other times a crutch. Decades into the Great Crusade, the campaign on 1544, was not going well. Ferris, alongside his brothers Vulcan and Mortarion, found himself and his legion struggling. Foul Xenos, the Eldari, that vile ancient race who didn't have the sense to bow down to the rise of mankind. Upon the desert plains, Ferris, Disan, Shadrach Medusin, Amadeus Duquesne, Gabriel Santire, Bion Henricos, and the Iron Hands fought. A slow, steady wave of iron and bolter versus the swift venom strikes of the Eldari. It boiled his blood to see how he and his legion were hampered, whilst his brothers seemingly performed better. Had he raised weak sons? His temper, the heat of the forge, or something kept at bay by his will of iron, faltered. He raised his voice as a hint of Disan's suggestion that the great Ferris Manus was thwarted by Eldari witchery. He was not himself. His quickness to anger was far above his usual demeanor. Only Fulgrim was capable of lightening his mood, but his brother was far from him. Alone with his first captain, Gabriel Santar, Ferris confessed, I have had strange dreams of late, of a desert of black sand, and of eyes watching, cold, reptilian eyes. Something had been toying with him, but he dared not appear so weak in front of his entire legion, or worst of all, his brothers. It was his weakness, the weakness of a human. The flesh was truly weak. Taking to the surface personally, Ferris and his sons plunged into the Eldari's desert stronghold leaving behind the mortal imperial contingents, too slow and hampered by the desert conditions. Again, the flesh had been proven weak. The foul Xenos had been waiting for them, ambushing Ferris and his forces. Clad in coal black armor, with a face hewn from granite, cold fury radiating from his every pore, Ferris battled the Eldari, but he became isolated, cut off. A storm of psychic origin tore through the Iron Hand, creating a barrier from them and their Primark. To approach it, all Bionics and Electronics malfunctioned and died. For a very legion, almost half machine, half man, their greatest strength had become their greatest weakness. Ferris was on his own. 
as his sons held bated breath and anguish at their weakness for not being able to aid their lord. Ferris looked around himself, his dull silver eyes gazing upon a gloomy cavern system. He pushed forward and then began to feel an intrusion into his mind. Visions, images of screaming dead, the sensation of a blade slicing his head from his shoulders, a memory of Vulcan gifting him a sword, himself letting his pride get in the way of accepting it graciously. Barbs and insults echoed around him until one cut deeply. Unwanted son. This last barb stuck in his throat. Ferris was remarkable upon Medusa. He was a king of kings. None could match him. But when his father came and brought him 17 remarkable brothers, he realized his place. Unlike Vulcan, who had accepted his position gladly and humbly, Ferris railed. Was he not the equal of his siblings? When faced with the glory of Horus, the majesty of Sanguinius, or even Rogaldorn's solidity, it was easy to believe that some sons would wait in the wings or the chosen few enacted their father's grand plan for the galaxy. His greatest fear of all was to be the runt of the litter, the weakest, the one left behind. From the shadows it came out, the cold reptilian eyes, the vision, a serpentine beast that moved at a speed that was beyond even his, stalking, attacking him as he moved further into the cavern eventually reaching a bizarre, decrepit throne room, complete with a rotting corpse upon a throne. How much was real, he could not tell. A half-serpent, man-beast finally revealed itself, and so the Gorgon of Medusa threw himself at it, obliterating the creature. He was victorious, but with his wounds pouring, his head pounding with rage, he threw open the doors behind the carrion throne, ready to confront the masters of his suffering and manipulation. You have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this, and you will find strength. A gem cannot be polished without friction, nor a man perfected without trials. Ferris strode out from the storm, alien blood slick on his torn battle plate. His sons were overjoyed, their Primarch lived. Gabriel Santa asked his lord what had happened to him, but Ferris told him it did not matter. For how could he tell his sons of what visions he had seen? The serpent man-beast of how the conniving Eldari had tried to tempt him by speaking of prophecy, of how they had drawn him here to warn him of a great doom, an angel exterminatus of his future death. But Ferris had defied the Xenos, roaring back, I know I will die, just as I know my place and duty, it matters not. If it is upon some blackened world I've never seen, or the very crags of Medusa itself, I am a warrior king, alien, but I am also something else, human. And unlike you, Eldar, we humans do not submit to fate, we shape it. But Ferris dared not tell anyone of what he saw or heard. The very idea that the Eldari had seen the possibility of manipulating him, that they perceived some weakness within him burned in his thoughts. Ferris and the Iron Hands finally left 1544. Compliance had finally been achieved, and the Great Crusade required their attention. The aftermath a sobering experience for the Legion. For their greatest strength, their iron had become a weakness, and the warnings of Xenos left unheeded. The decades began to pass for Ferris and the Tenth Legion, spreading out to the stars in conquest, as more and more colonies and worlds were brought into Imperial compliance. 
Eventually, Ferris and his sons answered the call for aid from an ultramarine and emperor's children contingent against the non-compliant pocket empire of Gardenal. Eleven worlds under the iron grip of the totalitarian regime, the so-called Lords of Gardenal. It was an empire of genetic manipulation, all humans genetically bred for their specific roles, each crafted towards traits that would allow them to excel at their permanent role in life. They were designed to be perfect. There were billions upon billions of them. A tide of engineered humans whose compliance was now Ferris's responsibility. Perfection. It was demanded of him. And so the work of compliance began. The Iron Hands descended down to the surface of Gardenal Prime. The Imperium's genetically advanced super soldiers against the hordes of vat grown people of Gardenal. It was a slaughter. For every Iron Hand, Ultramarine and Emperor's children, there were 500 Gardenal soldiers. But they kept coming. The enemy was literally throwing themselves upon the 10th Legion until their ammunition ran out and their weapons clogged with meat. But the Lord Primarch had not taken to the field. There had been rumours circulating the many fleets of the Great Crusade that his father the Emperor would be leaving the front line and handing the responsibility to another. Ferris knew the rumour and the possibility of one of his brothers being chosen to take up that responsibility. Again, his mind turned to his brothers. Fulgrim, his closest friend, an orator, a symbol that inspired, or Gilliman, an administrator beyond his abilities, and then Horus. They were all the same age, yet to be in the presence of the Lupercal, that charisma, it was as if he had been cast in the very light of their father. Ferris knew war, the path towards perfection, and the expunging of weakness. His conquest record was exemplary, but he knew his name was not spoken in the same reverence as Horus, Dawn, the Lion, or Gilliman. The prosecution of war against Gardenal had to be different. He had held back from his usual tendencies. He was capable of being level-headed and diplomatic, like his brothers. He would prove it. The battle upon Gardenal Prime was a slow, grinding affair, testing the patience of Ferris as he remained upon his Medusan carved throne, in orbit. He wanted desperately to turn to his old ways, a battle within himself, trying desperately to keep it in check. Finally, the Gardenar requested to negotiate once again, and made their way towards the Primarch and his flagship. Miles of cold, ceramide corridors the diplomats strode, finding themselves dwarfed by a vault door, with all the brutality and cold efficiency of Medusian design. Inside a warrior king's chambers, the representative lords of Gardenar looked upon a being whose genetic design was far superior to theirs. Ferris equally assessed them, looking upon one housed inside his own powered armor. He took it apart in his mind. The shielded coils, the energy reflective materials. He assessed the power of its cores and the hidden energy weapons his sons had missed. He felt a sting of annoyance at his son's ignorance and weakness in missing these facts. But his face remained stern and iron. Leaning forward in his throne, he asked the Lords of Gardenal if they had come to surrender. They had not, they replied. They had come to kill him. The chamber door mechanism locked as one of the Gardenal sacrificed themselves in an explosion. Ferris was locked within, alone. Ferris felt a presence touch his mind as one of the two representatives locked his gaze upon him. The Gorgon of Medusa leapt from his throne charging his would-be assassins. Forgebreaker tightened his metallic grip. The great hammer met sword and energy field as he began to duel the equally enormous Gardenal Prime powered suit. And then the room shifted around him. He looked around to see lava flows and Medusan rock. A howl echoed in the air, one he knew all too well. The haunting scream of Azunoth, the silver worm, 
More visions came, his brother Rogel Dawn standing over him, with his fists soaked in blood and a face of pure anger. Oh, he remembered that day, when he had pushed him that far, and he had reveled in that sensation. More visions came, of the time he scaled Karashi, of the great battles he had fought. This was not real, the other lord of God Anal. He was a psyker, trying to put him off balance as he dueled the mechanized warrior in front of him. The battle was brutal, hammer blows that could level mountains pummeled against energy fields. Vibro blades and plasma shot glanced against his Medusan forged plate. His own men outside were attempting to crack the very vault doors built by a Primarch. No help was coming. Again, the Psyker attempted to distract him, showing him visions of his defeat at the Emperor's hand. They laughed, declaring that they had already calculated his death. That they knew him. You have power over your mind not outside events. Realize this, and you will find strength. They knew him, he thought. Even my own father doesn't know me. Even from his earliest days, his greatest weapon had been his mind. His will to grow, to become stronger. He had power over his mind, and that very strength drowned Asirnoth. It led him to conquer a world, and even challenge the strongest being in the galaxy. They knew him? No. Only he knew himself, and what he was capable of. The Psyker had tried to throw his past defeats at him, believing it would dishearten him, but they did not know him. Not Ferris, because to him, they were not defeats. They were fuel on the path towards perfection. They were gifts. Ferris exerted his will, the power of his mind, and forced himself into the present. With hot rage burning in his veins, he lunged at the mechanized warrior and tore him apart with his metal hands. Oh, his brothers had known rage, but Ferris's was apocalyptic, and now victory was his. With his head thrumming with heat from the rage, Ferris walked up towards the Psyker. Words began to spill forth from the mortal human, but he didn't get a chance to finish, as Ferris rocketed Forgebreaker into the assassin who dared try to kill the Gorgon of Medusa. Ferris emerged from his throne chamber, but the mood amongst the fleet was solemn. The assassination attempt should never have happened, or have nearly been so successful. The efforts of Ferris's diplomacy had backfired, and now he had made an error. He had looked weak. It was a sensation that had to be quashed if the compliance of Gardenal was to succeed. Order and discipline needed to be revived, and so Ferris chose a conduit, an example for the Legion to bear witness to. I've never been able to find a challenge amongst my own sons. Ferris remained as still as a mountain as the third legion serfs clattered into the cage, pushing an arming dummy encased in Arkuduana's magnificent battle plate. Piece by piece they began unbuckling his training leathers and drilling him into his war harnesses, ignored by the Primarch as he spoke. Even the legion's ancients can only match me so far. I built this cage myself, for my brothers. Arkuduana held out his arms, while his serfs machined on plate and engaged the seals. Then these bars could tell some stories. Fewer than you might think. My brothers are surprisingly reluctant. Akuduana's eyebrow arched. The armorers moved to his legs. Oh? Fulgrim would joke that he would die with shame. Were his sons to see him defeated? Vulcan said that he did not want to hurt me. Me? I told him that I would make a finer weapon than that I gifted Fulgrim, and if he would try. And? And these bars have few stories to tell. But not none. Ferris's eyes glinted like daggers. His smile did not blunt their edge. I am honored, Lord. The armorers pulled and prodded at Akuduana's seals. The ranking surf work approached with his helmet. Akuduana waved him away. He was about to fight a Primarch and he intended to savor it. 
I do you no honor. I know. Your birth father fought the Emperor. He did. My brother speaks highly of you. I know. He says you have no equal. Akadawana shrugged, but felt a tingle of pride. Not so much in the fact as that it had been spoken by a Primarch. The Emperor's children boast many fine swordsmen. Ravash Kario has the potential to be great, and there is a brilliant young legionary in the second company called Lucius, who may yet reach my standard, if he can tear his face from the mirror. But they are not you. They are not me. I know how that feels. Akadawana pivoted around the waist, made some practice punches, testing the armorer's work. The power servos whined as he drew Timur and Athea. The serfs had rebelted his scabbards over his power armor, and the two Chanabral sabers emerged from their silks with the most expectant of sighs. An unmodified mortal at the farthest part of the hall would have felt it. Ferris's eyes flickered with self-hatred. Ferris manners attacked before the command to begin had left his mouth. Given his Goliath physique, his speed was staggering. A lesser duelist than Akudawana would have been pulverized on the spot, and even he was forced into an admiring grasp as the smoldering metal fists thundered past his eyes. The Primarch was holding nothing back, and with a roar he came again. A thrilling combination of terror and exhalation filled Akudawana as he ducked between blows, under them, away, fed by a lightness of heart he had not felt with a sword in his hand since the first time he had stood before old Corinth. Before the unification had been won, Ferris bellowed and swung with his left. Akaduana bent under it and allowed it to clang into the bars. He rolled back, always back. He did not bother using his swords to parry. It would have been like blocking a bane blade. He ducked and weaved, danced and slid, slaws a blur of feint and misdirection. His movements were intuitive, faster than Jean and Hans thought, but compared to the gap between the audacious youngster and the grizzled thunder warrior, that between Legionary and Primarch was a yawning one. He grinned. He was going to have to try. With sheer, bludgeoning power, Ferris forced him up against the bars. His swords bit at the vulnerable points in the Primarch's armor. Ferris ignored them. Stings from a persistent insect. He fainted with Timur, drawing the Primarch's eyes, and then used the lengths of Athenia to stab at the Primarch's groin. The mastercrafted saber pierced the heavy mail, only to become wedged between a pair of crushed rings. Ferris gave a snarl and smacked the blade with his wrist. The ancient Grecan blade shattered, rune inscribed metal shards daggering the floor at Akudawana's feet. The force of the blow splintered his gauntlets, sent hairline fractures running up Akudawana's vambrace, and almost pulled his shoulder from its socket. He cried out in glee. Why do you laugh? Ferris drew back, even unarmed he had reach. Akudawana could only shrug, enfolding Timur in a two-handed grip. <laughs> because... Spitting with anger, Ferris drove his fist at Akadawana's chest. Too big to avoid. Too fast. He cried out in shock as his breastplate caved in, splitting the Palantine Aquila into frayed halves, gold leaf fluttering around the hot liloquence of Ferris's arm. Knuckles ground in, his rib plate cracked, then shattered. Before he had even registered the pain, he was flying. Crashing into the bars with force enough to break more bones. The bars themselves were made of firmer stuff, built by Ferris' own hands to contain the might of a Primarch. They did not bend. Vibrating with a metallic basso profundo, they flung him back into the ring, sprawled on his chest and crying out for the pain of his fractured ribs. A great weight pushed into his shoulder, eliciting a murmur of pain then closed over it to haul him up by the golden fretwork. Ferris's eyes burned into his, consumed them in his, his expression incandescent as he drew back his arm to deliver a finishing blow. I, too, 
once fought the Emperor. He is a greater being than you could imagine. How did your mortal father manage it? Akutawana could barely see the fist before him. His eye had swollen. His face puffed and bloodied. He wished to give him every opportunity to yield. He gave a laugh, coughing it up in gurgles. Ferris frowned. Tell me why you laugh. Do you... do you not see? Ferris's grip tightened, a splintering of ceramite. Akutawana chuckled, winced, and then chuckled again. This... <laughs> this... this... is what we were born to do. Both of us. To fight, and eventually, one day, to lose. It feels... Good. Some of the aggression left Ferris's eyes. And one thing at least I was right. Our legions have much to learn from one another. He lowered Akudawana to the ground, where the captain proceeded to fold bonelessly over his knees. What is now past was your war. What now commences shall be mine. There will be no feast of celebration, no proclamation of victory. I do not claim worlds. I conquer them. My victories are their own proclamation. I will present my brother Gilliman with ash around a barren star. That shall be my proclamation. And the Gardenelle shall forevermore be remembered only for the manner in which they fell. His gaze passed over his warriors, silent before his scorn. For what they had just witnessed was not a contest, it was a lesson. I have sought to lead as Fulgrim or Gilliman would have led, but that is not my way, and is not the Medusan way. The Gardenelle have had ample opportunity to yield. Grumbles of agreement swept the hall. Akutuana swayed on the spot, blinking up at the Primarch, and it fell to Sirius to speak out. The Emperor desired these worlds intact. The Gardenelle rule over eleven worlds. I will give my father ten. The 413th Expedition will not act in defiance of the Emperor. You are derelict, Chapter Master. Sirius straightened against his wedge spear. I serve the Emperor of Terror, the ideals of his Great Crusade, my father and his brothers. In that sequence, I will not defy the first of my masters by ordering the destruction of Cardinal Prime. For a long time, Ferris glared down at the Ultramarine and then a smile found its way across his face. Perhaps if you were the 413th, where you belong, then you would have known. You are no longer in command of the expedition fleet. You, you do not have that authority. Gilliman can restore your command once he arrives. I'll be done with you by then. Until that happens, your orders come from I and Father Moore. He knows what I expect of my warriors. That's the problem with the path of improvement, the delusion of superiority, of purity. You lose the ability to listen. From such black and white views of right and wrong, you become unreceptive to the wisdom of others. They both knew what this was. They could see it in each other's eyes, an unspoken truth that did not need to be verbalized. Inside a fighting cage designed to hold Primarchs, Ferris glared down upon Arkaduana, champion of Fulgrim's Empress Children Legion. Ferris had challenged the legendary champion of the Third. It was a display, an unfair fight, but one to unleash the Legion's shame and unite them. Arkaduana was the best, a symbol to the Third whose very own father had the honor of dueling the Emperor in the early years of the Great Crusade. Akudoana was the best, he knew. There was no arrogance in that statement. Being the deadliest in the room was a sensation that Ferris knew all too well. The duel began. Ferris let flow the feelings of self-hate and shame, 
He roared with rage at his error, his weakness, and lunged bare-fisted at Akaduana. It was like a man fighting a wild beast, as Akaduana tried desperately to dodge the furious attacks of the metal-armed creature. The champion of the third lasted longer than any legionary before, but he still faced a Primarch. The champion's body was crushed, his ribs shattered as a living weapon nearly beat him to death. But where Ferris's features were of snarling hate, Akaduana was smiling. He was laughing. Tell me, why do you laugh? Ferris spat in his victim's face. Don't you see? This is what we were born to do. Both of us. To fight. And eventually one day, lose. It feels good. The words cut deep. The anger melted in an instant. It seems another understood the gift of being beaten. It seems another understood the gift of defeat. He was a Primarch. Triumphs and glory were common, but defeats, challenges that pushed him to the edge of his abilities, they were precious. That day the Emperor of Mankind, that golden beacon, that perfect warrior, handed him such an utter defeat. He saw the new possible heights, he saw the lesson and potential, he saw what true strength was, he saw his own weaknesses and how to eliminate them. That's the problem with the path of improvement, the delusion of superiority, of purity. You lose the ability to listen. From such black and white views of right and wrong, you become unreceptive to the wisdom of others. The Emperor had humbled him, shattered his self-delusion as the strongest being, and had shown him that he was not at the end of his journey towards perfection, he had only just begun it. Perhaps there was things that Fulgrim, Gilliman, or Horus could teach him, but he was not them. He finally saw it now, the path, not to be the best Primarch, the one lauded like his brothers. What he needed to be was the best Ferris Manus. He gently placed the wounded Akaduana to the ground and looked to his sons, declaring, The Gardenal rule over eleven worlds. I will give my father ten. He was the Gorgon of Medusa. He was no orator or diplomat. He was a conqueror. Gardner Prime fell under the full weight of Ferris and the Iron Hands Legion, no longer holding back. Destruction and devastation ground the Gardenal into submission and compliance. For nearly two centuries, Ferris had been at war in the stars. Long had been since his early life on Medusa. But once again, the balance of the galaxy shifted. The rumors were true. And at the dawning of the 32nd millennium, upon the world of Ulanor, the Emperor of Mankind, his father declared his stepping down from the Great Crusade. He would return to Terra to consolidate what the Imperium had gained. It broke the heart of all of the Primarchs, Ferris anguished at the thought of not seeing his father for a long time. But the Great Crusade would not be leaderless. One brother would be elevated above the rest. War Master Horus. Ferris could not begrudge his brother, for he had earned it. He knew he was a symbol the Imperium needed. With the Emperor returning to terror, a new era of the Great Crusade had begun. Again, the 52nd Fleet, Ferris Manus and the Iron Hand set out to the stars, bringing thousands upon thousands of worlds into Imperial compliance. It was in the years following the coronation of War Master Horus that Ferris and the Iron Hands found themselves on the tail of a new foe. Orbiting the sun of a desolate system was a nomadic fleet, containing colony ships from Terra's earliest expansions, millennia before. But to the Imperium scouts' disgust, they found a confederation of humans and Xenos, living together side by side. The Diasporax, a society not permitted in the bounds of the Imperium. The humans were offered a place inside the Empire, but they refused, leaving only war. 
For months, Ferris and his legion chased the shadows of this fleet, finding themselves outmaneuvered by the faster, sleek vessels. Ambush after ambush had begun to take a toll, enraging Ferris at the failure of his captains. His temper only once again, soothed by the words of Gabriel Santa, but the situation had become clear. The Diasporax required the Iron Hands to be the hammer, but they needed their anvil. Ferris declared to his sons that their brother Legion, the Empress' children, had been summoned and would join them soon in purging these Xenos. The roars almost deafened the chamber as the two closest brothers and legions at once more join in battle. Aboard his brother's ship, Ferris strode onto the embarkation deck. The warriors of the Third looked upon the enormous Primarch, his face like granite and his features stern and brutal, his nickname the Gorgon, earned. Ferris looked up towards his brother Fulgrim, and a smile, so warm and honest, beamed from him. They embraced like family. For what felt like the first time in decades, Ferris relaxed, truly comfortable. The warmness of his smile and his tone, a shock to his accompanying iron hands. Battle plans were made immediately, before the two Primarchs retired to Fulgrim's private quarters. It had become more of a gallery than a warship, the Gorgon remarked. Art was a distraction to him, but yet he respected it as part of his brother's path towards perfection. The galaxy had changed since they had last seen each other. The era of Warmaster Horus had kept them apart for too long. Each of them reveled in the time they had together but they had changed too. The title of prominence among his brothers to Ferris had seemed less enticing. He saw the weight of responsibility on Horus's shoulders. Realizing that being the best Ferris Manus, the path of perfection diverged from the path of Warmaster. But the change in his brother did not slip Ferris. He knew his brother better than anyone. His usual bravado and confidence a facade he knew to be a performance, to inspire others, seemed like it was becoming the real thing. It unnerved him, but yet his love for Fulgrim was blinding. The hunt for the Diasporax had begun. Ferris let loose the moorings of his fleet and roared towards the hybrid human and Xenos fleet. They had always been on the back foot, but now they had them pinned. The battle was fierce, but anchored in one place, the larger colony ships of the Diasporax were overwhelmed, the lighter cruisers unable to retreat and engage on their own terms, with the corridors slick with human and alien blood. The 3rd and 10th Legion had purged this filth, the humans choosing to fight rather than giving up their Xenos allies. The battle had been won, but something had felt wrong to Ferris. He had placed his flagship in front of his brothers, in the midst of battle, shielding him from a barrage. But this gesture was not reciprocated. Arriving aboard Fulgrim's flagship, Ferris and Gabriel Santar and his Morlocks arrived to what felt like a gauntlet of Fulgrim's warriors. The ceremony of fraternity had been conducted in haste, uncomfortably formal for what should have been the closest brothers and legions. Ferris understood that the legions had not left as friends. Shielding his brother's ship, the idea of being saved. For a man on the road towards perfection, he knew this may have wounded the pride of Fulgrim. He had known him for centuries, but still this reaction surprised him. It would be only a few short years after the destruction of the Diasporax that Fulgrim sent word that he was making an unscheduled visit to his beloved brother. That warm, honest smile creeped across Ferris' face as he welcomed again Fulgrim into his private forge, eager to hear the word that his brother had promised could only be spoken in person. I made that for Vulcan more than 150 years ago, said Ferris. So why is it still here? You know what Vulcan's like. He loves to work in the metal, and he doesn't trust anything that hasn't had the beat of a hammer laid upon it, or the fire of the forge in its heart. 
Pharos held up his shimmering, mercurial hands and said, I don't think you like the fact that I could shape metal without heat or hammer. He returned it to me a while later, saying it should remain here with his creator. I think Nocturne superstitions aren't as forgotten as our brother would have us believe. Fulgum reached up to touch the weapon, but curled his fingers into a fist before they touched the warm metal. To touch such a perfect weapon without firing it would be wrong. I understand that there is a certain attraction in a handsomely made weapon, but to apply such artistry to a thing designed to kill seems extravagant, said Fulgrim. Really? Chuckled Ferris, hefting Forgebreaker and pointing it at Fireblade, sheathed at Fulgrim's hip. Then what were you doing in the Urals? Fulgrim drew his sword and turned it in his hands, so that it caught the light and threw dazzling red reflections around the forge. <laughs> that was a contest, smiled Fulgrim. I didn't know you then, and I wasn't going to have you outdo me, was I? Ferris circled the iron forge, pointing his warhammer at the magnificent creations he had wrought and which hung upon the wall. There was nothing in weapons, machinery, or engineering devices that obliges them to be ugly. Ugliness is a measure of imperfection. You of all people should appreciate that. Then you <laughs> must be perfectly imperfect, said Fulgrim, his smile robbing the comment of malice. I leave being pretty to you and Sanguinius, my brother. I'll stick to fighting. Now come on, what's this all about? You speak of the future of the Great Crusade and then want to talk of weapons in old times. What's going on? Fulgrim tensed, suddenly anxious at what he was to ask of his brother. He had hoped to approach the matter circuitously, feeling out his brother's position and the likelihood of him joining them willingly. But with typical Medusan directness, Ferris managed to come right out and demanded to know his purpose. How artless and blunt. When did you last see the Emperor? Asked Fulgrim. The Emperor? What does that have to do with anything? Indulge me. When was it? A long time ago. Admitted Ferris. Arena Septimus. On the crystal headlands above the acid oceans. I last saw him on Ulanor. At the Warmaster's coronation. Said Fulgrim, moving towards the great anvil and trailing his fingers along the cold metal. I wept when he told us that he believed the time had come for him to leave the crusading work to his sons, and that he was returning to Terra to undertake a still higher calling. The Great Triumph, nodded Ferris sadly. I was on a campaign in the Kilar Nebula, and too far distant to attend personally. It is the one regret I have not being able to say my farewells to our father. I was there, said Fulgrim, his voice choked with emotion. I stood on the dais next to Horus and Dorn when the Emperor told us he was leaving, and it was the second most heartbreaking moment of my life. We begged him to stay to see out what he had begun, but he turned his back on us. He, he would not even say what his great work was, only that were he not to return to Terra, then all that we had won would crumble and fall into ruins. Ferris Manus looked up at him, his eyes narrowed. You talk as if he abandoned us. That was how it felt, said Fulgrim, his tone bitter. How it still feels! You said yourself that our father was returning to Terra, to preserve all that we had fought and bled for. Do you really think he would not have wanted to see the final victory of the Crusade? I don't know, said Fulgrim angrily. He could have stayed. What difference would a few years make? What could be so important that he had to leave us there and then? Ferris took a step towards him, and Fulgrim saw the reflection of his hurt anger in the mirrored eyes of his brother. The betrayal of everything he and the Emperor's children had fought for over the last two hundred years. 
I do not understand what you imply, Fulgrim, said Ferris, his words trailing off as the import of Fulgrim's earlier words came to him. What did you mean when you said it was the second most heartbreaking moment of your life? What could be greater than that? Fulgrim took a deep breath, knowing that he would have to come flat out and say what he had come to say. What could be greater than that? When Horus told me the truth of how the Emperor had betrayed us and planned to cast us aside in his quest for godhood, said Fulgrim, relishing the horrified expression of surprise and fury on his brother's face. Fulgrim! shouted Ferris. What in terror is wrong with you? Betrayed us? Godhood? Fulgrim took quick steps to stand before Ferris Manus, his voice passionate now that he had taken the final step and confessed his true reasons for coming here. Horus has seen the truth of things, my brother. The Emperor has already abandoned us and even now plots his apotheosis. He lied to us all, Ferris. We were nothing more than tools to win back the galaxy in preparation for his ascension. The perfect being he pretended to be was a filthy lie. Ferris pushed him off and backed away, his ruddy, craggy features pale and horrified. Knowing he had to press on, Fulgrim said, Others have already seen the truth of this and are moving to join Horus. We will strike before the Emperor is even aware that his designs have been unmasked. Horus will reclaim the galaxy in the name of those whose blood was spent to conquer it. Fulgrim wanted to laugh as the words spilled from him. The thrill of finally unburdening himself almost too great to stand. The breath heaved in his lungs, and he could not tell whether the thundering he could hear was the blood surging in his skull or the hammers of faraway forges. Ferris Manus shook his head, and Fulgrim despaired as he saw his brother's horror turning to fury. This is the new direction of the crusade you spoke of. Yes, cried Fulgrim. It will be a glorious age of perfection, my brother. What we have won is already being given away to imperfect mortals who will waste the glories we have won for them. What we have earned in blood and tears will be ours again. Can't you see that? All I see is betrayal, Fulgrim, roared Ferris Manus. You are not talking about claiming back what we have won. You are talking about betraying everything we stand for. My brother, implored Fulgrim. Please, you must listen to me. The Mechanicum has already pledged its support to the War Master, as have many of our brothers. War is coming. War that will engulf this galaxy in flames. When it is over, there will be no mercy for those on the wrong side. He saw the color flood back into his brother's face, a raw and bellicose red that he knew all too well. Ferris, I beg you, for the sake of our brotherhood, to join us. Brotherhood? Bellowed Ferris. Our brotherhood died when you decided to turn traitor. Fulgrim backed away from his brother as he saw the murderous intent in his blazing silver eyes. Angron is ready to strike, and Mortarion will soon be with us. You must join me, or you will be destroyed. No, snarled Ferris Manus hefting Forgebreaker to his shoulder. It is you who will be destroyed. Ferris, no, pleaded Fulgrim. Think about this. Would I come to you like this if I did not believe that it was the right thing to do? I don't know what's happened to you, Fulgrim, but this is treachery and there is only one fate for traitors. So you, you are going to kill me? Ferris hesitated and Fulgrim saw his shoulders sag in despair. I am your sworn honor, brother, and I swear to you that I do not lie, pressed Fulgrim, hoping that there was still a chance to convince his brother not to act in haste. I know you're not lying, Fulgrim, and that's why you have to die.
Fulgrim had betrayed him. He had betrayed the Emperor. And there were others. Angron, Mortarion, and Horus. In his most sacred chambers, overjoyed to see his closest friend in the universe, his joy turns to ash as Fulgrim began to speak, unfolding a tale for a new direction of the Great Crusade. Horus has seen the truth of things, my brother. The Emperor has already abandoned us, and even now plots his apotheosis. He lied to us all, Ferris. We were nothing more than tools to win back the galaxy in preparation for his ascension. Ferris couldn't believe what he was hearing. Like each word was slowly killing the friendship he and Fulgrim had for centuries. Hearing how he spoke of their father, the pinnacle of perfection, the star that Ferris's worldview orientated around, this new direction of the Great Crusade disgusted him. His heart began to quicken. He felt his pulse pound in his head as his rage began to rise. You are not talking about claiming back what we have won. You are talking about betraying everything we stand for. Our brotherhood died when you decided to turn traitor. Fulgrim pleaded with him, telling him you must join me or you will be destroyed. Ferris did not understand what had overcome Fulgrim, but he had betrayed him and the Imperium, and the only fate for traitors is death. Ferris's body tensed as he prepared to launch himself at Fulgrim. So, are you going to kill me? The statement cut deep. Even now, Ferris loved his brother, a bond like no other, but that was why it was so painful to have his complete and utter trust in a person shattered. He would never trust again, never allow himself to feel this pain again. Forgebreaker slammed into Fireblade as the two Primarchs tried to kill each other. Tears stung Ferris's eyes for the first time in his existence. But the look upon Fulgrim's face was a visage of twisted delight. It disgusted him. With blows that were too fast for the human eye, two demigods battled. Ferris's blows rippled vibrations through Fulgrim's bones, but his blade work was faster and he made a cut for his brother's head. Fireblade once again returned to the hands that forged it, as Ferris caught it with his bare metal hands. With his arms glowing from heat, Ferris broke the weapon that he had forged, the explosion throwing both Primarchs off their feet. Fulgrim, burned and his armor damaged, rose first. He stood over Ferris as both of their senses began to return. With tears still stinging his dull silver eyes, Ferris looked to the now stranger above him, declaring that Fulgrim had best kill him, for he will kill him if he does not. Fulgrim once again pleaded with Ferris, but his words fell on deaf ears. The Gorgon of Medusa would never betray the Emperor, never forsake the oath he had given. Fulgrim whispered to himself, that I will always be your brother. And then he struck Ferris in the jaw with Forgebreaker, leaving him unconscious. Ferris awoke hours later, finding his honor guard outside slain and the Iron Hand's fleet heavily damaged. Once again, the galaxy had changed. Civil war had erupted. Four legions under the banner of Horus had risen up in rebellion. Many worlds declared for the War Master. Zuno's attacks escalated, and warp storms began to ravage the galaxy. It was all chaotic, everything in flux. In his innermost sanctums, Ferris spent weeks on the forge, his place of comfort. They say the emotions of all craftsmen find its way into their pieces, and so Ferris began to reforge Fireblade, the one he had created in the Urals two centuries before. Once filled with love and admiration, it was now filled with vengeance and hate. His silver hands sculpted and forged as his mind drifted. Fulgrim had betrayed him. Had he let him live because of love or pity? Why did he believe that Ferris could turn? What did he see within him that was weak? 
Would his brothers question that tomb? Would the Imperium look to him and question his loyalty? He had to face him. He needed to purge these weaknesses from himself. The weakness of being perceived as a traitor, of letting friendship cloud him. Once again, defeat had taught him a lesson. Finally, through the warp storms, news came from terror. Seven legions were directed to crush this rebellion at its heart, upon the world of Isvan V. It had come to this. Two centuries of the Great Crusade, hundreds of thousands of worlds brought into Imperial compliance, billions upon billions under the light of the Emperor, and like all empires, when it reached the sea, it turned upon itself. Ferris sat across from his brothers, Corvus Corax of the Raven Guard, and Vulcan of the Salamanders. His enthusiasm was infectious. He was hungry for traitor's blood. Ferris had made up his mind, and once he had, there was no stopping him. Ferris Manus, followed by the unified clans of the Iron Hands, roared down towards the cold and bitter surface upon Isvan V. The loyalists crashed into the fortified positions of the traitors, beginning the bloodiest battle in the Imperium's history. The skies were lit in permanent orange. Smog and ash choked the atmosphere, as hundreds of thousands of superhuman warriors fought like animals, each side screaming cries of hate. The mortal contingents on both sides had become mad, through the sheer concophony of violence, the sight stomach-turning, ear ringing, pulse roaring. Ferris and his elite Morlocks charged the center, Astartes falling in their dozens to the demigod with silver hands. Thousands were dying every minute, but Ferris and the Iron Hands pushed forward. The flesh was weak, but the brutal charge of a legion of Ferris's sons was not. Finally breaking through, Ferris and his sons caught sight of the Third Legion, and what they saw disgusted them. Their armor, their features, had been corrupted. Horrifying displays of sickly color, extreme body modification, and flayed skin draped over them. For hours, Ferris and his sons fought. Skulls were crushed in his iron grip. It was like discarding necrotized flesh. They were cutting the weakness out of the Imperium. With a mountain of traitor and loyalist corpses around him, Ferris looked to the sky. Reinforcements. The Alpha Legion, Night Lords, Iron Warriors and Word Bearers had arrived. The traitor's line began to break. His brothers Korax and Vulcan called to retreat, to hand over the next assault to their brothers. But then he saw him. Fulgrim. He had to face him. No word seemed to reach Ferris. No reason or logic factored into his mind. Just the rage of one who had been betrayed. Surrounded by the last of his remaining Morlocks of Clan Averni, Ferris charged, leaving behind most of his legion. He scaled the hill before him, and once again his eyes met the brother he had once called a true friend. The sight of Fulgrim was heartbreaking and unnerving. He wore the smile of a killer. You betrayed the Emperor, and you betrayed me. The last words racked with emotion that he couldn't mask. Pain he hated himself for feeling. The flesh was weak. Again, Fulgrim tried to convince his brother to join them. The Emperor was a spent force and there was a new order in the galaxy. Ferris couldn't believe what he was hearing, even now, when Horus was on the verge of defeat. But Fulgrim smiled, and as Ferris turned around, horror ravaged his face. The second wave, the reinforcements, turned upon the Iron Hands, Raven Guard, and Salamanders. Ferris's sons began to fall, carved up and butchered, as a second treachery took place. For the first time in his life, Ferris felt true despair, as everything he had built died in front of his eyes. Hate. A rage so complete washed over him. 
He was the Gorgon of Medusa, the stubborn, brutal warrior king. But now he was a beast. He drew the Reforged Fire Blade, and the two brothers launched themselves at each other. They hacked and stabbed as the Imperium burned around them. Ferris felt the bone-shattering strikes as he sliced Fulgrim with his blade. They moved at a speed beyond mortal perception, until they broke apart. Ferris's wounds were pouring, never had he been pushed like this before. But this time there was no thrill, only emotional and physical pain. He began to overwhelm Fulgrim, ready to kill him, until Fulgrim drew his own blade. An alien, silver gleaming, and sickly purple light radiating from the hilt. Diabolical strength caught Ferris by surprise. He was thrown back, and his chest was gorged open. Ferris fell to his knees in pain. Clambering for Fireblade, he looked up one last time, seeing hesitation in Fulgrim. His fingers gripped the hilt of his blade, but the silver edge swung down. Fulgrim cleaved Ferris's head from his shoulders. Blood poured from the remaining stump as the limp body of the Gorgon of Medusa slumped to the floor. These are not my hands. This fact is forgotten by my brothers. Inexplicably, it has always seemed to me. The hands are strong, to be sure, and have created great things for us all. But they are not mine. And that counts for something. They forget that the silver on my arms comes from a beast that I vanquished. It is the mark of a great evil that I ended. And yet it persists within me. I would struggle to remove it now. And I will not remove the silver from my flesh, because I have learned to depend on it. The fault is with my mind. I rely on the augmentation given to me by the metal gauntlets, so much so that the flesh beneath them is now little more than a distant memory. A day will come when I will strip it from me, lest I lose the power to master myself forever. Already my legion's warriors replace their shield hands with metal in my honor, and so they too are learning to doubt the natural strength of their bodies. They must be weaned off this practice before it becomes a mania for them. Hatred of what is natural, of what is human, is the first and greatest of the corruptions. So I record it here. When the time comes, I will strip my hands of their unnatural silver. I will instruct my legion to recant their distrust of the flesh. I will turn them away with the gifts of the machine and bid them relearn the mysteries of the flesh bone and blood. When my father's crusade is over, it shall be my sacred task. When the fighting is done, I shall cure my legion and myself, for fighting is all there is. If we may never pause to reflect on what such devotion to strength is doing to us, then our compulsion will only grow. Bow to it, he said, handing the slate back. It will be quicker. The man slowly offered him the bloody saw, but Shadrach had already leaned over the side of the recliner and drawn his gladius. He set the edge of the blade along the clumsy guide cut that the bone saw had scored, paused, and then struck his ruined hand off with a single swift blow. It bounced off the side of the trolley and landed in the pool of blood on the deck. The surf hesitated, as though he felt it would be polite to pick up the severed hand and return it to Shadrach. Then he remembered himself, dropped the saw, and hurried forward to attend with clamps and wadding. If it's going to hurt anyway, said Shadrach, as the man worked, binding the stump tightly. It's better that it doesn't linger too. Good advice, he thought, applies to so damned much. Gorgonson returned an hour later and inspected the wound. Do this yourself. It seemed for the best. Shadrach replied. You're no surgeon, said Gorgonson. Never claimed to be, but your man there was intent on whittling me down until I was nothing but a spinal column and a rictus. Gorgonson frowned, 
We're doing the best we can, given the circumstances. Well, he made more of a mess of me in ten minutes than the damn sons of Horus could manage in a week. Gorgonson glared at him. Don't even joke. Damn you, Shadrach. Don't even say the words aloud. You don't think I'm angry? I'm beyond rage. I'm in another place entirely. White heat and boiling blood. I'm going to butcher and burn every one of the bastards. Give me my new hand so I can get on with it. Gorgonson hesitated. They had known each other for 24 decades. Like Shadrach, Goran Gorgonson had been a stormwalker, a son of terror. They had fought through the unification war side by side. At their ascendancy, Goran had elected to join Lokopt, the clan that most remembered and celebrated the Terran aspect of the founding. But he had changed his name to Gorgonson, in honor of the Primarch. Anger's not going to get us anywhere, Earth Brother, Shadrach said quietly. Except deader than we are already. Anger's a blindfold, a fool's motivation. I reserve it only for killing blows. We need cool heads and clear minds. This is survival, repair, rebuilding. Terra only knows we're good at repair. We excel at it. So this should play to our strengths. They're calling a council. Who's they? The clan fathers. A clan council? Well, what in Terra's name for? This isn't a matter of bloodline and heritage. The clan fathers are proposing to assume command. The clan fathers are proposing to assume command. Collective command. I suppose so. In the absence of... Gorgonson paused. There were words that were going to be hard to say. Names that were going to be hard to utter. The clan fathers take control for now. Isn't there comfort and assurance in that? They are veterans who understand. A clan council is the last thing we need, said Shadrach. Command by committee, pointless. We need positive, singular leadership. I didn't know you had aspirations of command. Gorgonson remarked. Shadrach thought about that for a moment. The notion came as a surprise. I don't. I've never considered it. I just know we need something now. Someone. We're dead without it. Just a shattered rabble. Gorgonson sighed. Any apothecary, even the best of us, will tell you that you can graft on a new hand, but you can't graft on a new head. Then we'll have to learn how, said Shadrach. A servitor besides Gorgonson was holding the augmetic on a tray. Nothing fancy, said the apothecary, reaching for a scraper and neurofuser. I have no juvenile packing left either, so you'll have to let it bond by itself. Don't test it, it'll be weak. For months, probably. Let it bed in and heal. Shadrach nodded. Just fix me up. I'm sure I'll have many weeks of calm and leisure to get the healing done. Gorgonson started working. Is he dead? Yes. You know this. Amadeus told me. It was confirmed from the surface. Lord Commander Amadeus is dead too, murmured the apothecary. Yes, I saw it. But his word lives. The Gorgon is dead, and our stepfather Amadeus is gone too. So we can lie down and die with them, or we can learn the graft heads. What are you playing at? Org asked. Shadrach could feel the Iron Father's anger radiating out like a force field. They stood on the caustic shoreline of the Sulphur Lake. Acid vapor swirled like battlefield smoke. What? We bite our lips now. Even now, in this predicament. Sorgal has no clan father here. You shame us in the company of- I shame you. Shadrach shook his head. Is that really what matters now? The shame of speaking out? Fates above, we are shamed enough. The clan leaders are groping around, trying to recover something we have lost forever. By the time they reach a decision, we will be discovered and slaughtered. Or, if they reach a decision, it will be the wrong one, and we will be slaughtered anyway. We need unification, Shadrach, said Org. For morale alone. I agree, but under one war leader, with one purpose. 
<laughs> one leader. Orc laughed bitterly. Who? <laughs> you, perhaps. Orc spat and looked away. No one wants it. None of us. Not a single captain. Not a single Iron Father. That's why the Clan Fathers have taken the lead. They are projecting a sense of security, of unity through our blood heritage. A reassurance in this time of loss through the bonds of fraternity. But it's a group decision so that no one shoulders a burden alone. No one bloody wants it. That's why no one has stepped forward and called the rally around him. He looked at Org. No one wants to be seen as trying to replace the Gorgon. No one wants to replace Amadeus Duquesne. No one wants to be seen as that impertinent or disrespectful. I understand it. He paused. But we need to raise the storm again. No one wants the command. No one wants to appear so arrogant as to imagine that he can assume the Primarch's role. But it's not a matter of want or pride of inglorious ambition. It's a matter of necessity. This talk will get you killed, Terranborn, said Org. No! Shadrach snapped, pointing towards the monastery. That talk will get us killed. He lowered his hand. The augmented graft had not fully healed and still ached abysmally. The violence of the gesture had jarred it. I have it on good medical authority that you can't graft on a new head, he said. Jebez Org uttered a dry laugh. He shifted his flesh spare frame and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. You don't need to be a medical authority to know that, he replied. I'm not suggesting that anyone pretend to be the Gorgon. I'm not proposing that anyone presumes he can command as well as Ferris Manus, or attempt to be such a master. I'm simply talking about focus of authority. One mind, one will, one iron drive, strong enough to compel us long enough to… To what? Do what needs to be done. Which is what? Survive? No. Shadrach looked out over the misted lake. He turns to the Iron Father. You can't graft on a new head, but you can cut off an existing one. We need to focus long enough to get to Horus, to cut off his head. We decapitate the traitors. We do to them what they did to us. We shatter them and scatter them to the winds. We end this treachery. After a moment, he added, Then we can die for all I care. We have learned what it means to be shattered and the path we must follow to achieve our vengeance. We must learn to pace ourselves, tactical restraint. We must learn the tactics and techniques of those thrown in with us, and respect them. We must take our iron and alloy it with the strength of those shattered alongside us. He was dead. Ferris Manus, son of the Emperor, the Gorgon of Medusa. His headless corpse was picked apart by the Emperor's children, like wolves to a carcass, each clambering for trophies. His head was tossed by Fulgrim at the feet of Warmaster Horus. Those dull silver eyes had been plucked clean, the sockets raw and bloody, the flesh was grey and dead. His jaw hung open, and bone projected from one side where it had been caved in. The victory cries of the traitors rung out like a carrion call across the Imperium, declaring death to the false emperor and to let the galaxy burn. The Iron Hand's legion had been decimated. Ferris was dead. First Captain Gabriel Santar was dead. Lord Commander Amadeus Duquesne was gone. All semblance of unity fractured and the desperate remaining few attempted to flee the massacre and fleet blockade. The Iron Hands, Salamanders and Raven Guard had been shattered. Two Primarchs were missing, but the Lord of the Tenth unmistakably slain. 
the survivors of the Isfahan 5 massacre were barely in the thousands, all of them wounded and damaged physically. Scattered ships held collections of Iron Hands, Raven Guard and Salamanders, all from different clans and companies, all disorganized. The Iron Hands had lost nearly everything, but worst of all, something had broken within themselves. Ferris was dead, their Primarch, their father, the star in which their existence orbited around. The Primarch who had united Medusa and had taken them to the stars. They couldn't process it. They couldn't reconcile that their gene sire had been lost, that he had been weak. He had let his anger and need to prove himself override his tactical sense. He had left them behind to chase his vendetta and lost. Pharos had let his human emotions get the better of him. The flesh was weak. And they had been weak too. They had failed to push through, failed to save their lord, because they were weak. Horus had shattered them because they were weak. They hated them. The traitors who paraded the corpse of their fallen brothers and Primarch across the Imperium. The anger was so complete, it had come back round into calm. And yet they saw that anger still, as the same weakness that had got their Primarch killed. The hate was justified, but was simply a symptom of something wrong within themselves. Many of the survivors across the Burning Imperium began to meet in secret. Conclaves in the dark like vermin, hiding from the light. Leadership had been taken by the Iron Fathers, a return to the Medusan way of life before the Primarch. It was the safe choice, one of fairness, but endless debate and subservient to tradition and indecision. No one wanted it. The responsibility, the arrogance to claim that they could unite the Iron Hands that the Gorgon had. Captain Shadrach Medusan, the Terran-born veteran couldn't stand it. The loss of his legion, his Primarch, and now the indecision of the Iron Fathers. Hoping to retreat into the remnants of their clan structure was useless. Why divide their strength now? A part of them couldn't blame them. They were simply seeking to find a source of purpose, of comfortable strength to fill the void within themselves. But talk like this would destroy them all. From such black and white views of right and wrong, you become unreceptive to the wisdom of others. They needed to raise the storm. Their Raven Guard and Salamander brothers had their own tactics of war, their own strengths. They were iron, but we must take our iron and alloy it with the strength of those shattered alongside us. They needed to become steel, strong but flexible. The Gorgon is dead, and our stepfather Amadeus is gone too, so we can lie down and die with them, or we can learn to graft heads. It was a difficult ask to the stubborn sons of Medusa, fiercely independent, even as a legion of Astartes in the stars, to ask them to declare that the tactics their Primarch had taught them was not good enough was a tough pill to swallow. The Iron Hand survivors scattered, finding that their very own 10th Legion cipher language had been turned against them. They fell into ambushes, another betrayal by the Emperor's children. Their stubbornness again had cost them, until finally many saw the need for a singular focus, one being at the top, Captain Shadrach Medusan. Alloying with the hit and run, stealth of the Raven Guard, with the enduring will and close range firepower of the Salamanders, the shattered Legion survivors began to reform themselves. Not 10th, 18th, or 19th Legion, but Astartes. Divided into cells, the shattered Legions began to harass the traitor supply lines. Ruthless fleet engagements and boarding actions became second nature to them. In the cold, claustrophobic ceramide corridors of Astartes' vessels, 
Iron Hands clashed against Sons of Horus, Emperor's Children and Alpha Legion, finding an outlet to unleash their hate and fury, finding it difficult to stop once the slaughter had begun. We need to focus long enough to get Horus to cut off his head. We decapitate the traitors. We do to them what they did to us. We shatter them and scatter them to the winds. We end this treachery, then we can die for all I care. The Horus heresy began to rage throughout the Imperium. Years of brutal warfare seemed to touch every system. All forced to choose between the Emperor or Horus. But what had become clear to the Shattered Legions was that there was something more to this war. They had seen up close the new disgusting visages of their once brother Legion, the Emperor's children. But after each engagement, they saw the traitor legions become more and more twisted. The warp storm that ravaged the galaxy were easily traversed by the forces loyal to Horus. Chaos. Foul corruption that stemmed from the warp. Four dark entities that called themselves gods had infected the War Master and his forces. Whispers and rumors of grand sacrifices and barbaric rituals were rife across the Imperium. Millions were dying, all the more reason to despise them. Even as the thought of these so-called gods and the truth about the warp conflicted with the Imperial truth, it was simply another situation in which they had to adapt. The Iron Hands were not whole, but many had been renewed by the purpose of methodical vengeance but not all fell into the weakness of human emotion. During the Great Crusade, slowly the Iron Hands had become their namesake, as Augmetics replaced the weak flesh, damaged or scarred in battle. Ferris did not approve of this, but kept his thoughts to himself, as one who relied on his own silver hands. With the death of the Primarch and the Legion shattered, there were some who could not bear the weakness that was their humanity, their anger, their hate, their sorrow, their overwhelming sense of shame and failure that haunted them in the moments of silence. It needed to be locked away. They didn't want to be like their Primarch. Some even went as far as to condemn the Gorgon of Medusa, a man who never truly understood the Medusan ways, an outsider. Others sacrificed the last piece of weakness within themselves. The Keys of Hell. Technology discovered during the Great Crusade that had been considered heretical by Ferris Manus and the Mechanicum of Mars. The foundation of faith in the Mechanicum had become the form of the Tenth Legion, the holy union between man and machine. But for the bitter survivors who only saw the path of the machine, and iron as a way to escape the weakness of their humanity. They turned the keys of hell. Castigan Ulok and his brothers became revenants, a consciousness forever locked inside. As the cybernetics took control, they became parodies of men, machines purged of emotion, engines of war, left with only cold logic. Never able to fall down the path of the Primarch would let his anger be the death of him. The flesh is weak. The sight of these Gola disgusted their surviving brothers, but open war amongst themselves couldn't be risked when there were so few of them left. The shattered legions were the broken remnants that numbered in the few thousand. Their deaths would only be spent on one objective. Horus Lupercal. I am not used to repeating myself, Primaris Deck Officer Vakul. This frigate is now under the auspices of the Iron Hands. It is currently interfering with my mission and will move aside. I demand to see the Lord Praetor. A rumble of hidden gears caused Kratos to turn in the same direction. In time to see the huge portal rumbling open and a blaze of light from the adjoining flight deck flooding between the receding doors. 
twenty figures were silhouetted against the dark, far bulkier than any normal space marine. As his eyes adjusted, Kratos recognized the Terminator armor, but unlike anything he had seen in a long time. The warplate of the Terminators was far broader and taller than standard legionary power armor, and these had an exoskeletal frame carrying slanted plates of extra armor, all decorated in the dark green livery of the Salamanders. Their hands were fashioned in a variety of powered fists, claws, and chain blades designed for close combat, anti-armor assault, and bulkhead cutting and in the right they carried an assortment of weapons ranging from simple combi bolters to triple barreled autocannons, plasma charges, and rocket launchers, and one carried an immensely rare, long-muzzled Volkite culverin. Yet it was not these amendments that amazed Kratos. The Iron Hands had numerous experimental suits of Terminator armor, with modified heavy weaponry and ablative shields. What stole the curse from Kratos' lips was the additional weapon systems mounted across the backpacks and shoulders of the Terminators. A plethora of armor-piercing missiles, las cannons, multi-melters and conversion beamers were all pointing in his direction. Each was quite literally a walking tank. The voice of R.E.E. emanated from the external vocalizer of the lead warrior. Spearhead Centurion Kratos. Welcome aboard the Hearthfire. These suits were designed by Vulcan himself, and we were about to transit them to the surface of Istvan when the massacre began. The Primarch gave me a direct order not to allow them to fall into the hands of the traitors, hence our swift departure. Arie swung first to the left, and then to the right, looking at the row of warriors behind him. You mentioned something about trying to take my ship from me. If the situation had not been so fraught, R.E. might have enjoyed the moment of hesitation before Kratos reluctantly raised his hand in salute and bowed his head to the approaching Pyre Warden. The Salamander's commander had not intended to humiliate his counterpart in this fashion. It had been happenstance that Kratos had launched his ridiculous coup as R.E. and the others were about to board their gunships in the neighboring launch bay. I expect you to return to the Forsyth immediately. Arie raised his powered fist and pointed to the storm strike. And take your legionaries with you. What a waste, replied the Centurion. He waved a hand at the Terminators, shaking his head slowly. Vulcan entrusted you with his work, and this is how you use it? Even of these armored suits, you cannot take the World Eater's fortress alone. Be thankful that there will be nothing for the enemy once I have annihilated the city after your deaths. It is not the armor or weapon that makes the warrior. It is the spirit. You will fail. Your sentimentality will be your undoing. The flesh is weak. I have heard you say that phrase on several occasions since our first encounter. I am not sure that you really understand what it means. You may have spoken with the Gorgon, but do not think to school me in the teachings of my own Primarch. What you say, the flesh is weak, is only part of the saying. In forgetting the end you have lost the meaning. Vulcan said it in praise of Ferris Manus after the 184th expedition when our legions jointly liberated the orc-dominated worlds of the Shokshua Cluster. The fighting had been fiercer than anything we had expected. Your Primarch said in jest that his arm was tired from killing so many orcs, and Vulcan retorted with, The flesh is weak, but deeds endure. It was a celebration of what they had achieved, and a remark that even Primarchs can die, but what they do will last beyond their lifespan. It was a message of humility, not condemnation. Flesh is weak because it knows it must come to an end, and so we must rise above the concerns of flesh and leave a legacy that others will be proud to inherit. Ferris Manus understood that. He was a harsh master, an unforgiving ally, but he was also a maker of things. A builder, not a destroyer. Kratos stepped back, 
shocked by Ari's words. In a moment, he had recovered, his confusion quickly turning to irritation. Another lecture. It doesn't matter what you say. The only thing you're going to leave behind on Prastis are corpses. Kratos spun away, shouting for his men to embark onto the gunship. He followed them up the ramp and paused. At the top, he looked back with the last shake of the head. Ari returned to his warriors and ordered the launch bay sealed again as they lined up to board the dropships. Ari looked up and saw dark blurs descending towards the ground. Torpedoes, he muttered, not quite believing Kratos had finally acted. Even the Terminator suits would be no defense against the ordnance designed to breach the hulls of battleships. If it spelled the end for the Salamanders, it also heralded destruction for the World Eaters. Ari contented himself with the thought that had he not taken out the shield generator, the forces would be using mass drivers and anti-ship missiles rather than pinpoint laser strikes. There would be deaths in the city, but far fewer because of the Salamander's actions. The quiet, confident voice of Veshtar broke through the fog of confusion and disappointment that clouded Ari's thoughts as he watched the dark smudges glowing larger above the citadel. Those aren't torpedoes. Pinpricks of fire became recognizable, flares of retro rockets firing. The torpedoes resolved into drop pods, several dozen of them, as they slammed into the rockcrete of the killing ground. Some petaled open discharging flurries of explosive warheads that slashed bloody holes through the world eaters, slave soldiers. Squads of legionary warriors poured from others, bolts, plasma and laser fire adding to the torrent of deadly fire. A second wave of larger craft hit the ground a few seconds later, their armored skin shed by explosive charges to reveal predator tanks, vindicator siege tanks and a dreadnought. The salamanders parted to allow the Iron Hand's armor to form an attacking lance pointed directly towards the inner fortifications. Lasers, whirlwind missiles, autocannon shells and a storm of other ordnance converge on the keep, lighting it with dozens of detonations and slicing beams. A predator tank slewed to a halt beside Ari, and he looked up to see the command hatch in the blocky turret flip open. Helmetless, spearhead centurion Kratos emerged from the inside of the tank. He raised a fist to his forehead, and then he cupped his hands to shout down over the din of the growling engines and the crash of the citadel wall falling under the bombardment. Your flank is secured. Push forward, Lord Praetor. I should not have doubted the strength we gained from righteous conviction. Let us leave a worthy legacy together. My thanks for setting me back on the right path. Deeds endure. You will never trust. You will never dilute your strength by fighting alongside another. We alone are strong. Honorable men are beloved of those who make metals and those who dig holes in the ground for the dead. Iron is unbeholden to honor. Sergeant Kratos began his bombardment. The World Eater's facility was shielded, but with enough ammunition it could be destroyed from the safety of orbit. An action blocked by the Salamander Ari with his own vessel. The Salamanders numbered barely a dozen compared to Kratos's over 200 Iron Hands. The World Eaters recruitment facility was creating more of these tormented Astartes, fit with that abomination the Butcher's Nails. The bombardment that Kratos had begun would wipe not just their enemies, but the civilians of this world too, whose only crime was being born to a world garrisoned by a traitor force. The discussions were fruitless. They were meant to be allies, and Ari outranked his Iron Hand brethren, but yet they both knew the Salamander couldn't do much in the end. Only the shared pain of Istvan V and the bonds of unity had halted Kratos, 
from blasting the object that blocked his guns. Ari knew that vengeance had consumed Sergeant Krasos, the one that had consumed all the Iron Hands in the years of the Horus Heresy. Was their Primarch like them? Or were they akin to their Primarch? That characteristic stubbornness, the promise to fulfill the path chosen by any means. Kratos and the Iron Hands despised the traitors more than anything. They would do anything, whatever it took to burn them to the ground. Ari counseled Kratos that even now in this war against heresy, that he had to think of the Imperium to come, of how they would rebuild after Horus is dead. The flesh is weak, Kratos sputtered. The philosophy that had been poured into him like molten metal into a mold. From the black and grey harsh skies of Medusa, all the way to the stars, all those born upon Medusa had endured that harsh environment, the brutal recruitment and training for a legion in the name of Ferris Manus, the Gorgon of Medusa. The temperament of the Salamanders was alien to Kratos. He could only see his counterpart concern for this compromised civilian population as foolish, as weak. Ari's humanity here was proving to be a weakness. His flesh was weak. Returning to their vessel with no compromise reached, Kratos awaited for commands he knew he would not obey. Though he had no desire to destroy his comrades, but nor would he suffer the World Eaters to live, to recruit. Kratos' patience wore out, and he prepared to board the Salamander's vessel to seize it. Stepping onto the deck with his greater numbers, Sergeant Kratos found that it was he who was outgunned, as he turned to see a dozen Salamanders armoured in enormous Saturnine Terminator armour. The ambush had been turned upon itself. As Kratos with shock, and then anger, as he knew he was outplayed. Ari and his brothers were going down to the surface. They knew it was their doom. The illogical choice. Once I have annihilated the city after your deaths, it is not the armor or weapons that makes the warrior. It is the spirit. You will fail. Your sentimentality will be your undoing. The flesh is weak. Ari caught him there. What you say, the flesh is weak, is only part of the saying. In forgetting the end, you have lost the meaning. The flesh is weak, but deeds endure. It was a celebration of what Vulcan and Ferret had achieved, and a remark that even Primarchs can die, but what they will do will last beyond their lifespan. It was a message of humility, not condemnation. Flesh is weak, because it knows it must come to an end. And so we must rise above the concerns of flesh and leave a legacy that others will be proud to inherit. Ferris Manus understood that. He was a harsh master, an unforgiving ally, but he was also a maker of things, a builder, not a destroyer. The words cut deep. Vengeance had consumed Kratos, all of the Iron Hands, even those who had destroyed their humanity and become revenant machines, the Gola. Ferris was dead, and all his sons had taken away from his life was only half the picture. The flesh is weak, so Ferris had spoken. He had never been afraid of death, but of never leaving a legacy. During the Great Crusade, they were building an Imperium for a golden age of humanity. Ferris crafted, he made engines of war, but he also made gifts for those he cared for, such as Fulgrim and Vulcan. The flesh was weak. One day even he would wither and die, so by his deeds he would live on, remembered by the people he had built the future for, the Iron Hands, Medusa and humanity. Armoured in their Saturnine Terminator suits, Ari and his salamanders made Planetfall. Like the walking tanks they were, they burst into the World Eater's facility, fire and plasma pouring from the exoskeletal guns. They reaped a heavy toll upon the traitors, but slowly one by one, Ari's brothers began to fall. 
the mission would cost them their lives, but many others would live as they finally reached the shield generator and destroyed it. Ari looked to the sky, surprised Kratos had even waited before beginning the now targeted bombardment. But the dark silhouettes weren't missiles. Astartes drop pods glowed from the heat of the atmosphere and rocketed down beside Ari. Kratos and the Iron Hands chose the illogical but human choice. They would fight beside their brothers. I should not have doubted the strength we gain from righteous conviction. Let us leave a worthy legacy together. My thanks for setting me back on the right path. Deeds endure. To live by your own convictions and not those of your enemy. That is true revenge. That would be the sons of Medusa's vengeance. The Iron Hands had been shattered, their Primarch murdered, and his corpse a trophy for Astartes that had fallen to creatures of the war. But even with their weak human flesh, they made the traitors bleed. All taking a toll, as Horus plunged towards terror. The galaxy held its breath, as the siege of terror had begun. The Iron Hands too far away to further influence the outcome. The legends, such as Shadrach Medusin, Bion Henricos, Cybek Wayland, Amadeus Duquesne, Gabriel Santar, and many others will be remembered as heroes of the Horus Heresy. A time of myth, etched into the walls inside Medusa's innermost sanctums. The Imperium had won. Horus had been slain, but the Emperor had been crippled, interned upon the Golden Throne as a Carrion Lord. The traitors were scourged from the ravaged Imperium, cast into the warp rift known as the Eye of Terror. It would be now that the galaxy would be cursed forever, to know only war. The remnants of the 10th Legion, the scattered warbands finally had breathing room. But before they could become a legion once again, the Primarch Rabute Gilliman unveiled the Codex Astartes. Each legion was broken down into thousand-man chapters. Never again would one individual be capable of wielding so much power like Horus had, like a Primarch could. The barely few thousand iron hands railed against it, even if they knew that after the shattering each cell had grown apart, some embodying the worst excesses of their core philosophy, their flesh is weak. Others who had alloyed with the strength of other legions and tactics that could not return to the old ways. It was with the return of the skull of their lord, the Primarch Ferris Manus, by Rogal Dawn, that the Tenth Legion agreed to the Codex Astartes. The time of the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy passed from living memory. Millennia fell away like sand in an hourglass, as the Iron Hands fought horrifying Xenos and rebelling worlds across the Imperium for millennia. The legacy of Ferris Manus, much like the Imperium itself, began to rot. You will never trust, you will never dilute your strength by fighting alongside another. We alone are strong. Honourable men are beloved of those who make medals, and those who dig holes in the ground for the dead. Iron is unbeholden to honour. The time of the Gorgon of Medusa to halt his son's reliance on iron and augmetics never came to pass. All that was left of the wisdom was the weakness of flesh. Eroding with each millennia, the sons of Medusa began to lock away their humanity. Never again would the Iron Hands be shamed by the failures of human emotion. Iron was strong. Iron didn't make mistakes. Iron didn't get angry. Iron didn't care for honor or brotherhood. The Iron Hands aspired to the purity of the blessed machine. Their flesh would decay and rot, but through the machine god, and the Omnisire, they would become immortal. It wasn't good enough. His body was weak. He had always known, but attachment to flesh had made him resistant to the action required. 
His encounter with Lidric had provided the final push he needed. He assumed that his friend had returned to his own ship, possibly sharing an orbit somewhere on the other side of the blockade, but in a way that no longer mattered. In the photo bleach color blotches that floated out of reach, above his flesh eye he saw the red eyes of Captain Hasrid, closer to him than the ceiling lumens were now. Part of him recoiled from the memory, but he made himself face it. The son of Korax, a death spectre he had later learned, having made inquiries of the cross scythe emblem with the Commandant's imager archives, had come upon him completely unawares. If he had been hostile, then Stronos would be dead. Add to that his humbling before the Iron Council and his wayward actions on Thenos, and it showed a pattern of behavior that demonstrated his fault. The eye was an obvious target. It nagged him for decades, and its replacement was an important step on his drive towards perfection. That it simultaneously deferred actions on the aspirations Lydric had cast against the Adeptus Mechanicus, he had noted and deemed incidental. Any action he might take now would be suspect in any event. For all he had been discomforted at first, he found that he craved the surety of the clan Interlink now. He desired the strength of his brother's will to brace his own. The flesh was weak. The bright metal cabinets fitted against the bulkheads rattled as someone entered. His first thought was that it was Haas, wheeling in a churisurical trolley, but again his senses fell below expectation. It was Ares. The dreadnought towered over the stowed instrumentarium, the restricted space making his heavy armored frame appear even more massive. His blocky torso pivoted as if to survey the room, thoroughly before entering. His optic slips appeared to alight upon Stronos, only by chance. Is Stronos injured? Stronos considered the silence, but decided that he could keep nothing from the ancient. I am defective. I seek to rectify that. How so? The Raven's son proved himself my superior. I must improve and adapt. Improve and adapt. We recall a time when Iron Hands were less like Christos and more like Card and Stronos. They were ruthless, yes, but adaptable. Not slaves to Capulus. You should have said as much before the eye of Medusa. Stronos returned, bitterly, his gaze fixed to the ceiling plating. Darsic cast our vote as we saw right. Our word would have made no difference. When you first stood before me, you declared the Iron Council would feel your wrath for their failure to hold Thanos. Your fury was sound. What became of it? Such strength of feeling is difficult to hold on to. In time, perhaps, Stronos will know this too. Stronos scowled. The facial twitch lengthened the visual wavelength, from infrared to microwave. The power conduits buried within the ceiling above his cot became a shadowy smear of crimson. You believed the decision of the Council to be errant, yet you left the argument to Verox. From each according to his ability, said Ares. It sounded like a quotation. Ferox is passionate and persuasive, even when two brick wore flesh in place of iron. The Verdan were thought primitive. Now we wonder if they are not the sole champions of the Iron Creed, as once we knew it. Shonos turned his head to regard the dreadnought. The metal roundels of his forechain bumped against the pallet and he resisted the urge to touch the augmentic vertebrae, suddenly bitterly angry. Irrelevant. All of it irrelevant. The Iron Council is ruled. It is clearly our decision making that is an error, not theirs. I will not weaken my brothers by standing alongside them in this imperfect state. We feel that we should experience contempt for such self-delusion, yet we find that we cannot care. How far from our father's likeness we have both fallen. Haas re-entered by another door. You are beyond my skills to restore, venerable, said the apothecary, bluntly. 
as a headless servitor pushed a Medicaid trolley and a whippish thing in crimson robe squeezed through the already cramped quarters. The Magos biologist rolled up long sleeves and rubbed his hands with counterseptic jelly while the servitor maneuvered around Stronos' bedside, its trolley rattling carelessly over the tension. With respect, Iron Father, your presence here serves no purpose. He waited a moment during which Ares offered a blank wall by way of reply, and then added, You take up space. Leave. The Christosian question makes all matters subject to doubt, Stronos said to Ares, voice low. All will be as it once was, once the arguments are resolved. Ares turned from the apothecary to him. His emptiness seemed for a moment sorrowful. Pardon Stronos speaks of the arguments. But what does he know of the question? For there is only one. Stronos made to formulate an answer, only to realize he had none. Often he had railed against the waste of energy that the Conclave brought on the Iron Council, but had never found the time to learn for himself what, in effect, it was all for. He shook his head honestly. He had been built to be a war machine. This round voyage to Medusa was the first time since his novitation that he had not been either in the thick of a war zone or in transit from one to another. Better to leave questions of doctrine to the tech priests and the Iron Fathers, said Haas, moving to Stronos' pallet and the waiting servitor even as he spoke. At the mention of his order, the Magos looked up but did not interrupt. Stronos frowned at the mortal. For every Iron Hand warrior on Medusa and scattered across the Imperium, there were thousands of servitors, menials and adepts of the Adeptus Mechanicus to service their needs. Noticing his regard, the adept quickly looked away. Stronos found himself wondering what else the unseen legions on which the chapter so depended might see and hear. A non-verbal burst of scorn rang from Ares' vocalizer. And you call yourselves men of iron, you who cede all free will to others and call it strength. Do you even know how the Conclave began? I know little of Christos beyond his role of honours, said Stronos, stung. I know that he was once considered an exemplar of the Iron Creed. As it is now interpreted for you, perhaps. What do you mean by that? Demanded Haas. Ares did not answer directly. It began on Columbus. Everyone knows that, Haas said dismissively, then picked up a spoon-headed implement from his Medicaid trolley and bent towards Stronos. And what happened there to cause such crisis? Ares countered. Stronos couldn't answer. He looked to Haas. The apothecary let out a frustrated sigh and said nothing, focusing instead on Stronos' eye. He had no answer either. Stow thy leeches, Apothecary. There is to be no bloodletting today. Ares backed out of the Chirogiacal Bay and into the main space of the Apothecarian. With some reluctance, Shona sat up on his pallet and pushed Apothecary Haas from him. Come, Cardan. We will show you what happened that day. Day will come when I will strip it from me, lest I lose the power to master myself forever. Already, my legion's warriors replace their shield hands with metal in my honor, and so they too are learning to doubt the natural strength of their bodies. They must be weaned off this practice before it becomes a mania for them. Hatred of what is natural, of what is human, is the first and greatest of the corruptions. It is the 41st millennium, the grim dark future where the God Emperor of Mankind sits upon the Golden Throne, a necrocracy to a rotting empire set upon all sides by Xenos and Heresy. Upon the world of Medusa lay the Iron Hands chapter, who for over 10,000 years have fought the enemies of the Imperium. 
across this world of dark stone and black smog choked skies. The sons of the Gorgon live in great bastions, fortress cities such as the Gorgon's Forge, a living example to the alliance between the Iron Hands and the Adeptus Mechanicus. Praise be to the Omnissiah and the Machine God. The direction of worship for the chapter, as they praise the holy union of flesh and machine. Sergeant Cardan Stronos finally returns to the world of his birth. After decades of non-stop war, the muted skies of this bleak world, an all too familiar visage. Drained of color, life, and vitality. His forge chain, an augmented vertebrae link, each piece showing an acceptance into the various clans of Medusa, a sacred piece of the sons of the Gorgon in the 41st millennium. A neural link to his brothers that left communication to the machine. Hatred of what is natural, of what is human, is the first and greatest of the corruptions. But that wisdom of the Primarch Ferris Manus never came to pass. For a chapter that had almost purged everything human about them. Stronos found no greetings, as his cyber enhanced boots hit the black sands of Medusa once again, for Brotherhood had rotted away in the millennia, before the machine efficiency of the Iron Hands chapter. Accompanied by the ancient venerable dreadnought Ares, the two traverse of the chapter's innermost sanctums, the Eye of Medusa. At the heart of the planet, inside walls of black volcanic rock, carved with stories of glory, of the legacy of the Horus Heresy. Decorated in brutal Medusan steel, the two made their way to the home of the Iron Council. The sight of the guards, the Hellfathers, unnerved even him. Ancient Iron Hands, who had turned the keys of Hell. There were machines, barely human, aspects of death, that sent shivers down the spines of mortal men. Inside the council's vault chamber, Stronos saw it. A senate of machine and steel. Forty-one seats occupied by the Iron Fathers and the holy veteran dreadnoughts. Cabling a node attached to their minds as they communicated using binary chant and neurospheric data blurts. Themselves locked into towering iron thrones with spinal plugs and cranial taps. Almost like human computers. Stronos and Ares had come to partition the use of full force against the rebelling world within the Medusan system, not knowing that they played a part in a grander debate within the chapter's elite. The Christos Question. The proposition of Iron Father Christos himself for the future of the Iron Hands. The debate had lasted for centuries, the Iron Fathers questioning whether to throw away the last parts of their humanity. For is the flesh not weak? Though no longer elected chapter master, Christos had divided the council, the various clans choosing sides as ancient rivalries and deals were struck. The Adeptus Mechanicus' influence also evidenced to Stronos and Ares. An endless debate on the interpretation of the will of Ferris Manus, 10,000 years after his death, all rooted in one truth. Stronos lay upon the Apothecarian's table. His last human eye had failed him, unable to catch the Death Watch Death Spectre that accompanied his friend Lydric in their conversations inside the Eye of Medusa. He had also spoken out in anger. He had been emotional during the Council's meeting as he decried the clear rigging of Christos and the Mechanicum's vote. He was defective, and so the flesh had to be replaced. The truth of the Iron Hands in the 40th millennium, the truth was that they despised themselves. The legacy of hatred towards their own flesh had rotted within them for millennia. They carved and butchered their own bodies, running away from their own weakness. Ancient Ares remembered a time when they were more like Stronos. A man and machine, still human, rather than the cybernetic cold monster that was Christos. 
a time when Astartes were not dominated by cybernetics and the use of neural inhibitors. Ares began to show Stronos the truth. In the vaults of Medusa, the two bore witness to the events on Columnus, reliving the memory through the recorded visuals of a long dead battle brother. Through the nauseating static and battle, they saw the truth that was almost erased from history, almost hidden. Iron Father Christos bombarding the enemy and his own men. A cold, tactical choice of a machine that did not have attachment to brotherhood. This was what their self-hatred had wrought. A chapter of revenants, machine dead, that inspired as much fear as any Xenos or monster of chaos. The chapter became divided further. Astronos' actions had drawn the attention of the Christonian's faction. War broke out as two sides battled for the soul of the sons of Ferris Manus, all leading to the revelations that shook the chapter to the core. The Sapphire King, a demon born from the psychic backlash of the death of Ferris Manus upon Isvan V, had manipulated them. It had fed upon the Iron Hand's self-hatred and desperate need to suppress their emotions, the action in itself an extreme that fueled chaos. Iron Father Christos had been corrupted centuries ago, a pawn to unleash the machinations of the Sapphire King. It had not been a strength to suppress their emotions, they had only bottled them up compressing them down to the point that they exploded in a violent release. As the chapter engaged in a brutal civil war, Cardan Stronos was struck by the revelation that by cutting off their emotions, his battle brothers were only causing themselves to fall to the corrupting influence of chaos. Their only chance to save themselves was not by cutting themselves off from their emotions, but by embracing them and shackling them to their iron will. The disgusting Sapphire King, accompanied by the accursed Empress Children and the corrupted Christonians, charged at the surviving Iron Hands. The battle brutal and bloody, Stronos and all of them feeling the touch of chaos, trying to break in and weaken them, to make them push their emotions down, until it exploded. Stronos ordered his chapter, no, his brothers, to release their anger, lest their foes destroy them with it. They were machine, but locked within them was the fury of the Gorgon of Medusa, slayer of Azirnoth, scaler of Karashi, uniter of Medusa and son of the Emperor of Mankind. Their emotions no longer their weakness or shame, but strength. The Battle Brothers disengaged their inhibitor protocols and loosened their furious battle cries. As the emotional floodgates burst open, the Iron Hands turned upon the forces of chaos. Working together with feelings like trust and brotherhood, once again in their veins, they outclassed their enemies. The Sapphire King shrieked in rage as they obliterated its form from the material universe. The chapter had suffered numerous losses. Half of the Iron Fathers were dead, and many of their numbers slain by their own hands. But they were pure once more. Our chapter was driven to the very lip of the precipice. We were forced to stare over its edge into the Stygian depths, into the darkness that awaits us should we ever fall. Yet fall we did not. What saved us from this terrible plunge? Brothers, what has proved our redemption? Not logic, not the desperate, dogmatic purge of all things perceived as weak. It were our souls that saved us, and the strength we hold within ourselves, our courage, our collar. It was these qualities which makes us more than just unthinkable steel that pulled us back from the brink. The path towards perfection was shaved by the gift of failure. Wisdom, the Gorgon knew. Electing their new chapter master, Cardan Stronos, the sons of the Gorgon would no longer suppress their emotions. They would conquer it. 
they would alloy it with the strength of iron and live a legacy worthy of Ferris Manners. The flesh is weak, but deeds endure. And to have courage, to at times make not the logical, but human choice, required something the machine could not provide. Humanity. Perhaps one day they will choose to strip the metal from them, lest they lose the power to master themselves. But the Imperium, the Omnissiah, and the Emperor of Mankind required perfect warriors to destroy the enemies of the Imperium, the sons of the Gorgon, the legacy of Ferris Manus, the Iron Hands.